Hello everyone and welcome to a different type of video today. I'm taking you with me on a journey through my entire initial and completely clueless playthrough of Aliens Dark Descent. Now I know the game's been out for a while by the time you're watching this video, but I played the game when it first released, I just didn't stream it. I wanted to experience the game myself as a regular player without having stream chat to help me. I know the game has had a few patches since release, so some things I'm saying may not be relevant to the current state of the game, but I can only talk to the version of the game that I played, so that's what I'm going to do. For those who don't know, this game is a squad-based RTS game set in the Alien universe. I was really excited for it from the time I saw the first trailer, and I was hoping it was going to scratch that XCOM itch. Now, does it do that? Well, the short answer is no, not even close. But you all know I'm a long form kind of guy, so I'm going to have to give you a more detailed answer than that. And I am going to cover the whole game, so needless to say there's going to be spoilers, but the big plot reveals come later on, and I will give you a warning before we get to those. So feel free to just watch the first part of the video if you don't want the story spoiled for yourself. And with that being said, let's get into it. The game is focused on the planet Lethe. It seems like a pretty miserable place that Wayland yutani has mining operations on. And for those new to the alien lore, Wayland yutani is a mega corporation that has gotten up to some ethically questionable activities in the past. On Pioneer Station above the planet, a dock worker gets bonked on the head, and then the game is afoot. Our alien boy has been unleashed. Then we meet Maiko, the game's main character. She gets scolded by her clearly incompetent boss, and then runs off to her room like a scolded child. And I gotta say, I can relate. So here the game introduces us to the movement mechanics. It's pretty straightforward. One click to walk, two to run. And we soon encounter this synthetic that totally isn't evil. I mean, imagine having to share a workspace with this thing. No thank you. In her room, Maiko accesses the security feed of the dock, and she hears screams of bloody murder while one of the security cameras goes offline. Now at this point, she doesn't call anyone. Instead, she decides to investigate the dock herself. She asks for the security guards to accompany her, but they tell her they're not interested. And I have to say, this game is doing an awesome job at capturing the dysfunction of bureaucracies. Inside the dock, she encounters a worker who has literally left a trail of blood and dies right in front of her. And she still doesn't call anyone for help. So yeah, our protagonist, ladies and gentlemen, is a complete moron. And at this point, it's feeling like one of those bad horror movies where the only reason any of the plot happens is because there's not a single character through the entire chain of events who has a brain in their head. She catches a glimpse of the creature hunting her and then encounters a heap more corpses. And she still doesn't call anyone for help. Now she makes it back to the boss only for the whole room to get gobbled up by facehuggers. Luckily for her, she has plot armor stronger than Zionzi, so she's fine. And look at how easily she throws this monster away from her, like it was nothing. Now remember this moment, we're going to revisit this. Maiko encounters creepy synthetic man again, who is just chilling in a room full of destruction. He says the creatures destroyed the communication equipment. Now Maiko is suspicious of this, as the creatures seem like wild animals and shouldn't have any understanding of a communications array. Now for people who have seen any of the films, this is an obvious observation to make. But for Maiko, it's actually quite a stretch. She's barely laid eyes on these things, how does she know they aren't capable of higher level reasoning? Doesn't really make any sense. Here we see a ship leaving the dock. It's the one that left the aliens on board the Pioneer, so Maiko is desperate to stop them. So evil synth man convinces her to activate the Cerberus Protocol, Waylon yutanis quarantine solution. The problem here is that while the Bentonville, the ship that she wants to stop, will be destroyed by the Cerberus Protocol, so will all the other ships in the vicinity, one of which is the USS Otago, a military vessel. 
And if we activate the quarantine procedures, the Otago is going to get obliterated as well. Now it's a big ship. There's a lot of innocent people on there. So what do we do? What do we do? Yeah, we blow them all sky high, of course. Maiko's not playing around here. But before we can celebrate a job well done slaughtering hundreds of people, we get our first real view of a xenomorph, otherwise known as an Alamao. And it's coming for Maiko. And I love the way the dock workers got completely destroyed within seconds, but for Maiko here, the alien literally just stands there and lets her run away. The plot armor on display here is insane, and the whole thing feels really contrived. And speaking of contrived, it's finally time for some actual gameplay, and it's a glorified game of hide and seek. You have to use cover to sneak past the alien and make it to the exit. Now the alien kills me in about 3 seconds, and would you look at that, things are looking more realistic now. So I reload, and this part just sucks. The save point is before the cutscene, not after. And this is inexcusable. I've been complaining about this since the PS1 days. Have the checkpoint after the cutscene. We don't want to watch the cutscene multiple times. So it takes three attempts, but I finally make it out of the room. Of course we have the Midnight Suns effect, where even though we evaded the creature in the game, it still manages to find us in the cutscene. But no worries, as more plot armor is here to save the day. We've got some marines led by Sergeant Harper who are here to save us. They apparently came across from the Otago before we blew it into pieces, so that's good for us, I guess. And now we're finally able to control a squad of marines featuring Harper, Latimer, and Ruiz. And we actually have some decent guns to defend ourselves now, so things are looking up. And the game has the classic motion tracker from the movies, complete with sound effects. It's pretty cool. And basically, any movement in the nearby vicinity will appear on the minimap, giving you some idea of where the bad guys are. Some face huggers swarm us, and it's here we can use the game's freeze mechanic. By hitting the spacebar, you can either pause the game completely, or slow it down to a crawl. Kind of like the VATS mechanic in Fallout 3 and 4. Now I played the whole game with pausing rather than slowing down. The game can be super stressful at times, so being able to pause and take a moment to think is super helpful. But I could see slowing down being useful too, as you could more easily wait for enemies to be in the right position before launching your attack. Now while the game is paused, we can use a command point to launch a grenade. And as we progress, we'll learn lots of valuable skills that can be used for command points. So getting yourself more command points is gonna be vital. They do regenerate over time, and there's things you can do to increase their regen speed, as well as the maximum number that you can have. Now definitely not evil Synthman appears and tries to murder us. I'm so surprised by this turn of events. Truly, it's shocking. Anyway, we get to test out Suppressive Fire and blow this Tin Man apart. Now Suppressive Fire is kinda like Overwatch. Your Marines will fire at any hostiles within their line of sight, and Suppressive Fire increases the rate of fire, but decreases the accuracy. So if you know an enemy is coming from a particular direction, you can set up a nice kill zone to hit them extra hard. And of course there are extra abilities that can buff your Suppressive Fire that you can unlock in the game. Now here Latimer gets attacked by an alien and it explodes on her, causing acid damage. Some of the Xenomorphs explode with acid upon death, so you want to avoid close range as much as possible. I know, I was bummed about it too. Now here I try to adjust the graphics settings. I've got the graphics up to maximum, but the game still looks kind of bad. Now the environments look great, but the characters themselves are strange. There's like a weird fog or blurriness around them, I couldn't find any obvious setting that was causing it, so I think that's just how the game looks. And I did get used to it after a while. As we're leaving, Harper has some kind of 
brain problem. I don't know, but he seems to have the ability to sense the aliens. Now, I believe this is what writers often refer to as a ghost. You introduce some kind of backstory or mystery to the character to create intrigue. How did he get these powers? How exactly do they work? Yeah, it's interesting. Let's see how long it takes us to get our answers, shall we? So after an hour of play, we make it off Pioneer Station. The Otago has crashed onto Lethe's surface and we follow it down. Now some people survive the crash and this ship is going to serve as our strategic layer for the game. So yeah, after an hour, we finally finished the tutorial. And in the original version of the game, the tutorial was unskippable. Thankfully, I believe that horrible design decision has been patched out of the game since. The idea of having to play that tediousness every single campaign sounds truly awful. I did have some issues with textures taking a second to pop in here, but I think that's more a problem with my PC than the game. I later ended up changing the graphical settings to high rather than maximum, and that helped with the pop-in. And the game didn't really look any worse. Not that I could tell. So our situation is that the Cerberus Protocol will destroy any ship attempting to enter or leave Lethe. We're stuck on a planet that's likely infested with xenomorphs with extremely limited resources. It's a cool premise. Now on the Otago we have an infirmary where we can heal injured troops, a workshop where we can build new weapons, and a laboratory where we can conduct research. So all the basic things for a game like this are there. There's also the command deck where we can launch missions. And speaking of, we've got a distress call from Dead Hills. Honestly, who names these places? Whatever, let's go. So we can choose a four-man squad to control while Harper remains in the ARC. It's basically a tank and it can provide us some support on the field. Now Dead Hills is on lockdown and I love this line from Harper. You know what this reminds me of? We don't know it was those creatures. Could be an uprising, could be anything. Yeah, okay bro, it's definitely not the creatures that just overran an entire space station in less than an hour and who most likely came from the planet that we're now standing on. Harper is actually making me miss Bradford, and that is quite the accomplishment. So what do we do once we arrive in this Dead Hills hellscape? We lift the quarantine, of course. No questions asked, no information sought after. We'll just open everything up and hope it all turns out for the best. What a brilliant plan. Then we find an alien skin on the ground. Yeah, like this thing has been shed. And listen to what Harper says this time. Marines, there's something in here with us. It doesn't take a genius to guess at what. Stay sharp. No, Harper, it certainly doesn't take a genius. It apparently does take more than you, though. This man is memeing on himself at this point. I mean, that's my job. He can't take that away from me. Now, the way that missions work is that you generally have multiple primary and secondary objectives. Primary objectives must be completed to unlock the next mission, while secondary objectives are completely optional. They might make things easier for you or provide some nice rewards, but at the end of the day, it's up to you whether you complete them or not. And the maps are these big, reasonably open areas. You can explore and look for loot or just make a beeline to the next objective. It really is your call. On most of the missions, there will be an area where you can download a map, which makes navigating things much easier. But downloading each level of the map costs one tool. Now this is a limited resource, so you want to make sure that you've got some of those handy. The game forces us to place a motion tracker down, so I guess we're not entirely out of the tutorial just yet. Motion trackers reveal enemies for a 60 meter radius, and you can activate them once to draw all nearby enemies to the tracker. It can be useful for getting yourself out of a bind. So we proceed into the next building, and the motion tracker we deployed tells us that something just ran past. We can't see it, but we know it's out there somewhere. And the game does a really awesome job here of building the suspense. I really felt like the marines in the film Aliens just before the poo hit the fan. People who have seen the movie know what I'm talking about. We find a survivor who is unconscious from a facehugger. 
Now trying to remove the creature will kill the settler. So instead we kill the settler ourselves. I mean, it's better than having an alien burst out of your chest, I suppose. But see, because our idiot marine has used a gun, that attracts a nearby alien. And basically causing any noise, shooting or running, is going to draw nearby creatures to your location. And once one of them spots you, the aliens will enter a hunting state where they're actively trying to find your troops. Now during this state, the alien difficulty meter increases, and your marines will accumulate stress. Engaging enemies and taking damage will increase stress as well. But see, I wasn't really aware of the stress mechanic when I started playing, so I kind of just ignored it. So we'll come back to it in a bit. In the meantime, I'm just happily exploring and destroying any aliens I come across. As we explore the level, we find both loot and a survivor who may actually survive this time. We bring him to the ARC and we have a few options here. Firstly, we can send the survivor into the ARC. So he can just chill in there and we know he's going to be safe. We don't have to worry about protecting him from aliens. But the other thing here is that our troops can actually ride in the ARC too. It can transport us to other areas on the map. And it's not like a loading screen, no, no. Our soldiers physically enter the vehicle and it then drives them to where they want to be across the map. Not only that, but it has a super big gun and will attack any hostiles that get close to it. This thing is so cool. And I love the idea that it gives you a port in the storm that you can return to when things are looking tough. I found having a little area of safety that I could retreat to really comforting. But it gets even better than that. You can command the ARC to move around the map even when your squad isn't riding inside it. So you can make sure the ARC is at the nearest deployment spot of whatever building that you're going to be exiting from. So it's just there waiting for your troops. And there's another useful strat that if you need an area cleared out to make passage safe for your soldiers, you can often command the ARC to drive through the area. It'll gun down any enemies it sees while traveling through. That's going to clear the path for your troops. And yes, it can run over bad guys. And yes, there is a steam achievement for doing so. This vehicle is such a cool addition. It would have been so easy to just make the ARC a glorified fast travel marker, but I'm really impressed with how this was implemented. This thing is awesome. However, it does come at a cost, and I'll talk about that later. For now, we found another survivor. We meet a vet named McNeil. She gifts us a sentry gun, which is probably my favorite item in the game. Just like the movies, these are small turrets that you can deploy wherever you want and they'll automatically target any hostiles that approach. You can carry one per soldier, which kind of lets you double your squad size. Now they do take time to set up though, so you do have to be careful with them. So we fend off a wave of aliens and then the vet gets abducted by an alien in the vent. And my problem with this is, why doesn't our motion tracker pick this alien up? Even before the wave of creatures attacks us, listen to the dialogue. Wait. Hold on, squad. I think company's coming. You sure? I see nothing on your trackers. Even the character in the game is telling us this mechanic doesn't make sense. There's nothing on the tracker, so why are so many aliens flooding us? Why can't the tracker detect an alien in the vents? It makes no sense, and it's not in line with the films. And when even the character in the game is telling you things don't add up, that's a pretty bad sign. And this is a recurring problem. You rely on the motion tracker, but aliens can still spawn right on top of you. When the game wants a set piece to occur, it'll happily disregard the motion tracker altogether and just have aliens appear out of thin air right on top of you. And the writing in this game honestly isn't that great. The characters aren't particularly likable, and everything just feels kind of contrived. But even though the story is mediocre, the gameplay is where the real enjoyment is to be found. We're just going around the settlement, looking for survivors, picking up loot, and stomping bugs as we go. And then something happens. 
the difficulty of the aliens increases from easy to medium, and this seems to trigger a massive onslaught. It gives you a warning to set up your defenses because a swarm of xenomorphs is incoming. Our sentry guns are redeployable, so we slap it down, we set up some suppressing fire, and we allow the devastation to begin. We continue completing objectives, and we're now investigating a shipping container that we think may be related to the people who sent the aliens to the Pioneer. And when we activate this data pad, the game gives us a warning that completing this action will give us a dangerous encounter. And it's about here I realise I've made a terrible mistake. See, by this point, I've been playing the game for a long time, almost three hours. And two of those hours have been spent on this very mission. And I remember thinking to myself while I was playing that the missions in this game are super long. But it's because I've kind of been doing it wrong, I think. See, in addition to moving us around the map, we can actually extract the team on the ARC at any time. And I don't think you're supposed to do the whole mission in one go. See how above my Marines information boxes there's a whole bunch of red icons? Those are all traumas. Negative abilities that we've picked up from allowing the troop stress levels to get too high. So between the entire team, that's 12 negative abilities they've accumulated. Now I didn't realise this as I was just happily wandering around slaughtering the Xenos. Like I said, this is a clueless playthrough. So I decide this is a good time to gather a couple more loot boxes and then we're gonna evac. And for a guy like me who's all about the narrative, this felt kinda cringe. Like, we find the container, we literally walk right up to it, and then our squad's just like, nah, we're kinda tired, let's just go home. So while I do appreciate the game giving me a heads up about a tough encounter incoming, it did ruin the immersion a little bit. And once we arrive back at the Otago, I realise just how monumentally I've messed up. Pushing the squad so hard has resulted in each of them keeping one of those traumas they've picked up. And the other thing is that every soldier in your barracks starts with a trauma too. So now these guys have two each. And what's worse, I can't find a way to remove them. So I've just made four of my troops much less useful than they would have been otherwise. And some of the traumas aren't that big of a deal, but some of them are really annoying. So this is a pretty big blunder on my part. Now, I did consider restarting the game here, but I didn't want to play the tutorial again. And besides, seeing if we can overcome this setback from my incompetence should be pretty fun. I hope. We do unlock the barracks with our next visit to the base. When troops level up, they get one attribute for free. These vary greatly from increasing accuracy to increasing the squad's movement speed to removing the soldier's starting trauma. And you get one of these attributes for free with each level up. Now in addition, each soldier can get up to five upgrades. You unlock these by reaching certain levels, but they do cost materials to unlock. And materials can also be used to make new weapons. And the weapons are expensive. So it is a balancing act, and you probably won't be able to afford everything you want, especially in the early game. Like, I didn't even end up using the iconic flamethrower for the whole game because I didn't want to spend the materials to buy it. Now, there is one upgrade your soldiers can get that allows you to start each mission with an extra ammo clip. I highly recommend putting this on at least a couple of your soldiers in the squad. Ammo is going to be a very valuable commodity. At least it was for me. And the survivors you rescue will join the crew of the Otago, either as soldiers, physicians, which help speed up recovery of injured troops, or engineers who generate materials as passive income for you. So it's definitely worth saving people when you can. And there's no unlimited new soldiers that you can recruit here. Recruitment options are somewhat limited, so you want to find people whenever you can. So now it's time to redeploy, and we're going to head back to Dead Hills. My original squad is now crippled with traumas, so we're going to use a fresh one. And check out this guy, Neron, or Neron. He looks pretty cool. Kind of reminds me of Cassius from my Phoenix Point videos. But he has a horrendous starting quirk. 
50% of the time his weapon jams. So we're going to have to be really desperate before we deploy this guy. In the meantime, we do have Latimer who joined us on the Pioneer. But do you notice anything different about her? This was her on the Pioneer. This is her now. Yeah, she's changed a bit, hasn't she? Now look, I don't care about a character's skin colour, but why on earth is it different? The devs made a character model for Latimer on the Pioneer and then used a totally different one after that? This is just bizarre. Anyway, let's go take on that difficult encounter with a fresh team. And this one, well, it goes bad. Real bad. That difficult encounter the game warned us about well, this hulking monstrosity appears and just charges at us. And as soon as I saw it, I kicked myself for not laying down a sentry gun first. I do try to do it after the monster is activated, but the big boy is having none of it. And I will admit here, I was completely overwhelmed by this fight. The first thing I did wrong was standing still. Unless you have a well-defended position, you generally want to be moving backwards away from the Xenomorphs. As long as you do it at walking speed, the Marines will keep shooting. And then check this out, an alien grabs Kurtz while we're distracted by the big boy. So yeah, aliens can abduct your troops, which is a thing I didn't know until this encounter. And even as they're dragging your soldiers away to a horrible demise, they still move really fast. So Kurtz is gone, and I don't think she's coming back. So I could run back to the ARC and redeploy with a new squad the next day, but I don't want to do that. See, after we finish the first mission, or our first deployment, the planet infestation level increased by one, and it's going to increase every day by one. At this point in the game, I have no idea what the maximum infestation level is, or how bad things are going to be when we arrive there, but I do know I'd rather not find out. So it's in our best interest to finish this mission quickly. So we'll just continue on with three soldiers. Surely it can't be that bad, right? Yeah, even I don't believe that. We have to return to the second floor of the colony, which is a lot scarier than the first floor because the ARC can't support us up here. So if things go sideways, which we've seen how they can, we're on our own. Now we manage to avoid the aliens and make it to the colony director's office. We're trying to determine where the shipping container came from. And at this point in the story, we're really just doing detective work. It kind of reminds me of season one of The Expanse, which is pretty cool. Now unfortunately, the director's terminal is encrypted and we need the pass key, which is on his body. Now where's his body, you ask? Well, he apparently went missing next to an old mine shaft. So this seems like it's going to end really well, doesn't it? As we're trying to sneak back to the first floor, I realise there's just way too many aliens in our path. So we can either engage them, which I'd rather not do as it's going to increase our stress levels, or we can try something else. Remember that motion tracker we deployed last time we were here? Yeah, well it turns out it's right where we left it and we can still activate it to draw all the nearby xenomorphs towards it, and that leaves our path to the exit nice and clear. And this was so cool. I really thought we were trapped, but we avoided any conflict. And see, this leaves a really interesting scenario. The map will remain more or less constant even after we leave and return. Things don't respawn on our next deployment. If you place an object somewhere, it'll still be there when you return. Now, if it's a sentry gun, it may have been destroyed by the enemies, but it will still be there and you can repair it. If you welded a door shut, it'll most likely still be welded shut when you come back. And this gives us an interesting choice. See, when you find materials, medkits, tools, or sentry guns in the field, you can take them with you when you evac. Ammo, however, you lose at the end of the mission. A team has a set amount of ammo they will start a deployment with, and having picked up extra on the last deployment won't give you any benefit. So when you come across loot, you're often left with a decision to make. Do I take the loot now, or should I leave it here and pick it up on a later deployment? 
If I think I'm gonna evac soon, maybe it's a better idea to leave the loot where it is and give the returning team access to it when they get there. It's a very interesting dilemma and I really like it. And this design also adds a certain element of Persona and FromSoft vibes actually. See, you can unlock shortcuts throughout the map so that when you return on a future deployment, the squad can make progress much more quickly and potentially avoid enemy encounters that the first squad had to go through. And I gotta say, I love this. Having a high stressed and injured team that you desperately wanna evac, but you know if you push on just a little further, there'll be a shortcut waiting for you to make the next deployment easier for the next squad. It adds a lot of tension and it really feels like all the Marines are working together, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. It's an awesome idea. But let's stall for just a moment longer. See, before we can enter the mine, I send the squad into this little room. Here we can weld the door behind us, creating a safe haven. That allows us to rest, which reduces our stress levels. It kinda reminds me of the camping mechanic in Darkest Dungeon, and resting is key to being able to go on long deployments without stress building up. You can also unlock perks that improve resting further, such as giving you ammo top-ups, and you can also heal stress by using medkits as well. Also, I should mention that there are some traumas that may actually make resting worse, like there's one where one of your soldiers will take damage when you rest, so you want to get rid of those as quickly as you can. Alright, I've rambled enough, time for the mineshaft. And in here, it's a Lovecraftian nightmare where the aliens are taking over the environment itself. Pretty much what you'd expect if you're familiar with the franchise. And we again get a warning about a tough encounter. I send a marine to activate the terminal, but then as soon as I clicked on the terminal, I remembered the sentry gun. So I try to cancel the action of the marine accessing the terminal, but the game won't let me. And I find this kind of hilarious. Like one of the marines is like, hey, just wait two seconds to open the door with the hideous monsters behind it so I can set up this turret to cover us. And the other soldier's just like, nah, ain't nobody got time for that. So long story short, we get charged by a queen. And the queen's health bar is absurd, as you would expect it to be. Now we do get the sentry gun deployed, but she destroys it super quickly. And once again, I was extremely overwhelmed here. There's a reason I play turn-based games and not RTS. We have the queen in front of us and minions attacking us from behind, and I just didn't know what to do other than shoot blindly and hope for the best. And the best is not what we get. One of our marines gets strangled by a facehugger, while a second gets abducted while they're being strangled by a facehugger. This is a disaster. So Latimer makes her final stand against the Queen and defeats her. Yeah, it turns out it actually wasn't too tough. Just keep moving and take advantage of the Queen's lack of speed. Wish I had known that earlier. But see, the issue now is that Latimer is all alone in the middle of an alien nest and she's being hunted. And here you can see it's possible to pick up the dog tags of fallen comrades. They give a small amount of XP. And some aliens drop genetic material, which we can use for research points. The good news is we find the director's keycard. The bad news is we also find a survivor. It's the vet from earlier. Now our girl Latimer isn't just gonna leave the vet down here. We need to get her to safety. Now of course the vet is unconscious, so we're gonna have to carry her. And while we're carrying somebody, our soldier cannot attack. And our problems only get worse from there. Harper and Maiko want us to run back to the Queen's body to collect the genetic samples. And we've got a massive onslaught coming that Latimer's gonna have to hold off all by herself. I set up a turret, but it gets destroyed in seconds. And then I remember there's this thing called the Retribution ability. It restores up to 2 HP and makes your command points regenerate super fast. Now it's a limited use ability. I believe killing aliens builds up the meter, which then allows you to activate retribution. So we get to see Latimer power walking backwards, blasting A's with a shotgun again and again. The shotgun also uses command points. And with retribution active, our command points are coming back almost as quickly as we can use them. 
And once more, Latimer somehow prevails. I have no idea how this woman is alive, but I'm all for it. Now I have found a second sentry gun in a case down here, so we quickly deploy it, which should help keep the A's off our backs. See, the aliens just keep spawning infinitely. Just a single one, always emerging from the same place and making a beeline to our position. The turret can keep them at bay while we harvest the queen. The real problem is carrying the vet. We can't attack and we can't sprint. So the turret is the only thing keeping us alive. So between alien spawns, I quickly set up the turret to cover the alien spawning point. But see, after I do that, a second alien comes in from the side and starts hitting the sentry gun. So this forces me to attack, which aggros the aliens, and now more of them are coming for me. The second turret also gets destroyed, so at that point we just grab the vet and try to sneak by. But the game has a tendency to spawn aliens near you, so that strategy isn't really going to work. We get spotted, and they start charging. We're forced to leave the vet and fend them off. Once the creatures are dealt with, I try to go back for the vet, but a crusher, one of those big boys who annihilated us earlier, is here. And when the alien difficulty meter gets too high, these boss style aliens can spawn as regular enemies. So needless to say, we run away from it, but we find ourselves in a dead end, literally between a rock and a hard place. Now I figure it's over at this point, but Latimer, she still refuses to go down. We blast the crusher with a shotgun, which slows it down just long enough for us to run past it. See, when it's not doing a charge attack, it's actually fairly slow moving. So we race towards the elevator and we escape the beast. Now we could just jump in the ARC and leave, but McNeil is still down there, so we gotta go back. Now I know, any sane person would have just abandoned the mission at this point. We've completed the primary objective, we can move on. But regular viewers of my streams will know I can be pretty stubborn at times and I was set on getting this civilian to safety. So we run back in, having looted a toolbox which allows us to repair one of the sentries. And something awesome happens here. The game glitches and the alien gets stuck in place. So it can't chase us, but because it's still alive, a replacement won't spawn. So it's time to grab the vet and we just start slowly making our way to safety. And I have to say, playing this was crazy. It was super stressful and really memorable. I was biting my nails, desperately hoping that no more aliens were going to show up. And I absolutely loved it. And hey, there we are. Latimer makes it out with the vet. It was just an insanely awesome sequence. And Latimer just became the MVP of this game. We learned the container came from Berkeley's dock, so we have our next lead for mission site number two. But before we do that, listen to how our research man, Becker, talks about the aliens here. That specimen you've recovered offered outstanding research possibilities. Have you had the chance to review my initial report on the Xeno samples? I've barely slept. Oh, yes. Of course. Well, suffice to say, they're absolutely fascinating. I feel my muse gathering herself to action. All manner of breakthroughs tantalized just beyond my fingertips. He sounds a little too enthusiastic for me. What do you think the chances are this guy is evil? I try out some customization options on Latimer. She's earned it after all. But they're honestly pretty basic. There's not much to say here. So Latimer is going to lead our team into Berkeley's docks and we're still trying to find more information about our mysterious shipping container. But something really interesting about this second level is that we have to face down against human enemies. Now some of them have guns, which changes the combat mechanics a bit. Instead of wanting to keep moving, you're better off getting in cover and holding your position. And it's cool that the game mixes it up like this. And interestingly, fighting humans seems to cause a lot less stress on our marines. Plus, the aliens won't go into hunting mode because we're not fighting them. Now this makes sense, as humans would be less intimidating than space monsters. And it also helps reinforce just how dangerous the aliens are. 
so I like the fact that the humans don't seem like as much of a threat. But the real question is, why are these people attacking us? And we'll need to keep digging into the game's mysteries to find that out. Inside the docks, the buildings are much larger than what we were dealing with on the last map, so the ARC is a lot less useful to us. The deeper we are into one of the buildings, the further away the ARC is, and we can't always easily fall back to it for support. And it actually doesn't take long for me to run out of ammo. Now once that happens, the Marines switch to their sidearm. Initially that's just a handgun, and it really sucks. Now what I should have done here is found some ammunition crates on the map, but I was still figuring things out at this point, so I didn't know how easy or difficult that would be. So instead, we just evac out. Latimer gets a promotion to level 3, and she can now specialise in a particular class. There's five classes, and each soldier upon reaching level 3 will be able to be promoted into one of two of them. And I like that it gives you a choice between two rather than forcing your soldier into a particular class. But you know what I would like even better? If you could choose whatever class you wanted out of the five possible. And I've never really understood that about these games. Like what kind of military has the soldiers choosing their role instead of the leader? It seems like a recipe for disaster. So with Latimer, I have the option of a Recon or a Medic. Now the Recon can equip the Sniper Rifle as a special weapon instead of the shotgun that she currently has. The Medic, meanwhile, decreases the healing time of using a Med Kit by 50%. And to me, Recon sounds way better, so we go with that. And once your soldier has their class selected, they'll gain three unique upgrades that you can unlock. Again, you do have to pay for these. And speaking of Latimer, she suffers a nervous breakdown. Now after that previous mission in the mineshaft, I honestly can't say I blame her. But see, what's happening here is that often on the strategic layer, you'll get hit with random events. And you usually have a choice as to how you respond to them. I decide to let Latimer take a rest, partly because she deserves it, and partly because the alternative is giving her a random trauma, which I definitely don't want to do. So with our A-plus player taking some much-needed R&R time, we head back to the docks with a new team. We're on the second floor, trying to find the installation's command center, when the dock workers try blowing us up. Now even though we survive the explosion, the sound draws aliens to our location. Yeah, these dock workers are trying to herd the aliens towards us. What a bunch of absolute mad lads. Now Harper tells us to run, but I decide deploying a turret is actually the better option. It covers us quite nicely as we make our escape. Now once we locate the command center, we need to get inside. To do this, Maiko aboard the Otago needs a SATCOM. Then she can presumably access the door controls for us using her high level clearance with Waylon Yutani. Now as we're looking for the SATCOM, we stumble into a group of facehuggers. Killzone gets jumped by one of them and I have no way to save him. Apparently removing facehuggers from a soldier is an ability that we don't currently have access to. So I'm forced to just stand there and watch as Killzone rolls around on the ground struggling fruitlessly to survive. It's rough. And remember how easily Maiko threw a facehugger off her in the beginning of the game? Yeah, apparently a highly muscular and well-trained marine is infinitely less capable of doing this task than Maiko the random civilian is. I'm telling you, that plot armor she has is made of really stern stuff. Then aliens come charging in, and I'm still in a bit of shock after what happened to Killzone, so my reaction isn't particularly good, and Ruiz ends up getting abducted. Maury, meanwhile, gets a concussion and passes out, leaving Fetterman all on his own. Now, he naturally doesn't last very long, he's just one guy, and there you have it, our first squad wipe. And here, I was met with a most unwelcome surprise. There's no continue button, only load 
and main menu. Yeah, this game doesn't actually allow you to progress after a squad wipe. Just back to the last save point and try again. Now I'll fully admit this was my error, but I had just assumed a game like this would allow you to continue after a squad wipe. It's one of the reasons I love games like XCOM and Phoenix Point. They allow you to continue after a failure state to see if you can overcome this setback you've just faced and still obtain victory. Now compare that to a more cinematic game like GTA or God of War. In those games, if you die, you just restart and you do the section of the game again and again and as many times as it takes for you to beat the level. Now that's fine, but it has a couple of implications. Firstly, there's no stakes to it. Who cares if a character dies because all that happens is you reload and do it again so they survive. And now that I know this game doesn't allow progress after a squad wipe, it makes Latimer's epic display in the mineshaft mean a lot less. Because really, I should have just reloaded and done the queen fight again in the mineshaft. I mean, just look at it this way. What if Latimer hadn't been able to escape the mine on her own? My game would essentially be soft locked and I'd have to reload anyway. The only difference would be that I'd have wasted a whole heap of time trying to get Latimer to safety. If we can't continue after a fail state, the moment a fail state is looking like the most likely outcome, there's no reason not to just reload the game right then and there. Better to reload now and have to play 10 minutes of progress again than reload later and have to replay half an hour or more of progress again. So when success is the only possible outcome, the risk of failure becomes nothing more than an annoyance. And for me, that makes the game a lot less interesting. The second issue is that the game becomes a lot less dynamic. In those cinematic games I just mentioned, every playthrough is more or less the same. Sure, you might use different weapons or strategies, but ultimately, Every single time you play that game, the events are going to unfold the exact same way. So there's not nearly as much replayability, at least not for me. And this is actually one of the problems I have with the design of Aliens Dark Descent. As an example, if we return to the ARC like I said I was going to, having it drive you around the map is great, but the trade-off is that the map for the first mission is going to be the same every single time you play this game. And removing random maps again hurts replayability. Exploring a well-crafted area may be fun the first time, or even the first few times, but eventually it's going to become tiresome simply because you've seen it all before. And for me, and this is just my own opinion, but that makes the game less fun. And here I started thinking about why the devs made this decision. I mean, we can leave the map at any time. So what's the difference between leaving with four soldiers alive or zero? Either way, Harper can drive the ARC back to the extraction site and we can return to the map later with a new team. It seems like a weird decision to not allow squad wipes. And it's here that I think I realized why they've done it. It's because instead of focusing on a more random XCOM style of campaign, the developers have gone for something more cinematic. See, when the hallway that we were in blew up, there was a time when we were actually cut off from backtracking. So if the squad died during this section, we wouldn't be able to send a new squad in and continue from that location, because that location is currently unreachable. And there's a few times in the game where these sorts of things happen. Making every playthrough different and always hitting the player with unexpected events, that's what the medium of video games was designed to do, at least in my opinion. Video games alone have the power to make every experience different. A novel or film can't really do that. It's the same whenever you read it or watch it. And so when you try to make your game more cinematic, there's a price that you have to pay for that. XCOM is such a great game because it lets the player tell their own story. And RPGs like Dragon Age and Fallout allow the player to do this to a lesser extent as well. And these are all games that I love. 
And I'm not saying that cinematic games are bad, I'm just saying it's not what I personally wanted out of this title. And here's the thing, I didn't lose another soldier for the whole game. Whenever a soldier died, I just reloaded. I didn't really see any point not to. The idea of continuing on with less soldiers, drastically increasing your chances of getting squad wiped and having to reload anyway, well that just seemed like a monumental waste of time. And after this, the game really turned into more of a puzzle game. Like when we get to the same encounter with Killzone's team a second time, and I know what to expect, I know the facehuggers are going to jump us, well this time we win easily. And that's pretty much every encounter in the game. Just play it once, and if things go poorly, just reload and play it again. It'll be much easier because you know what to expect. So the whole idea of taking your time just goes out the window. Just play recklessly, and if things go badly, you can just reload. Because the thing is, things could still go wrong even if you play carefully, and you're going to have to reload anyway. So again, why waste the time? Now the game does have a no one can hear them scream mode, which I think is meant to provide a more hardcore experience, but from the in-game description, all this setting does is make the game autosave less often. So if you do have to reload, you'll be replaying a much larger section of the game. So it's just going to make things even more boring. I mean, it's not more challenging, you're just going to have to waste a lot more time. And the problem is still fundamentally the same thing. A squad wipe means a reload. So every mission has to be a success. There is no diverging from the given path. There is no surprise. And that means there's not really much reason to play the game more than once. And I think that's a shame. So I wish the devs could have found a way to include continuation after a failed mission. I would have enjoyed this title a lot more. And let's just talk about game saving while we're on the subject. It occurs at set intervals in the mission, normally related to objectives or set pieces, and when you rest. So you can't just go to the menu option and manually save the game. You want to play this game? You better make sure you're not going to have any interruptions because you can't just save and quit at a moment's notice. And this is honestly a horrific idea. I mean, I get what they were going for. Limiting saves to punish reckless play. If you die, you're going to have to go back a long way. But surely they could have balanced this out better. I mean, look at Tomb Raider on the PS1. You found save crystals throughout the level. Now, they were a limited resource to prevent you spamming them, but you could use them whenever you wanted. You know, so your whole schedule didn't have to revolve around playing a video game. And if people could figure this stuff out in the 90s, why can these developers not manage it today? And why punish the player for reloading anyway? I'd much rather you get punished for failure in a way that's fun, like having to overcome a brutal squad wipe and seeing if you can pull it off. Not by having to waste my time doing something I already did. And this really soured my opinion of the game. And I understand, for some people, this isn't going to be a big deal, and you're probably thinking, why is this man ranting about this so much? And that's fine. I'm just saying, for me, this really diminished the game's quality. So we return to the Otago, still without having made it into the command room. I was feeling pretty deflated after that forced reload, so I wasn't playing my best, and we racked up stress and injuries pretty quickly. And check this out. Latimer is having another nervous breakdown. Like once, sure, twice in a row, this is getting a bit ridiculous. She went from the MVP to the crybaby of the team real fast. So we redeploy the Killzone crew and they can finally reach the command room, which directs us to Warehouse C at the docks. And on our way there, we come across another spaceship, which is pretty neat. So we've made some progress and that's good, but to enter the warehouse itself, we're going with Latimer now that she's finally stopped moping about. The team encounters another queen and we get overwhelmed really quickly. But thanks to our newfound powers of reloading, 
On the second attempt, I know where to place the sentry guns and the queen can barely touch us. The game really has just become trial and error at this point. Alright, I'll try to stop being so negative. In some good news, we've unlocked the training room in the barracks. This allows our soldiers who aren't on missions to obtain passive XP, which is a really good feature. This way, if your troops die late game, you can replace them with someone who will still be a lower level, but at least they won't be total garbage. And even better than that, we've now got access to the psychiatric care unit. This allows us to remove traumas from our marines. Now, I don't think you can get rid of their starting trauma, but any that they pick up during combat on missions, you can get rid of. So that first squad I sent spiraling into a mental hellscape may actually turn out all right after all. I was actually really happy about this. So now we've learned that the containers housing xenomorphs have come from a refinery near a town called Aldevi. So that's our next destination. And it's here we start learning a lot more about exactly what is happening on Lethe with the aliens and the crazed dock workers. So if you want to avoid the heavy spoilers for the game's story, now is probably the time to stop watching. But for everyone else, let's jump right in. And we're so low on troops who aren't traumatized or injured that I'm having to send in Neron, the guy whose gun can jam at the drop of a hat. Yeah, times are pretty rough here. Now, the refinery level starts off reasonably similar to the earlier maps. Dark, dingy, and claustrophobic corridors everywhere we turn. But as we progress, we get into these somewhat more open and really visually impressive areas. We see rooms that have huge amounts of pipes and stairways underneath us. There's even some areas where you can see down to the mountain system the structure is built on. Now while these remain mostly just eye candy and we can't actually explore them, it still gives the level this awesome feeling of verticality. Like this structure is absolutely massive and we're crawling around on top of this vast metal juggernaut that sits at the top of Lethe. It's really cool. Then the story takes a bit of an interesting twist. We encounter this guy who has an infant alien inside him. And not the usual way either, but inside some kind of fish tank looking thing carved into his chest. It's pretty gruesome. And he appears to set some xenomorphs on us like attack dogs. And he also appears to be a bit more of a bullet sponge than the other humans we've encountered, so the enemies are definitely getting tougher. And once this psychopath and his pets are dealt with, we find some survivors. One of them mentions the Darwin Error. Apparently some kind of cult that worship the aliens. And one of the survivors mentions the cultists have been dragging some people off to their temple. Now I can't imagine it's going to end well for those unfortunate souls. And I have to say, I really like this twist to the story. I was expecting the entire premise to be that Wayland yutani released the aliens to gather combat data or something like that. Just some cliche story that's already been told to death in this genre. So I was happy that things were playing out a bit differently. And then we get this insane chase scene. We're returning the civilians to the ARC when we trigger an alien hunt. Now the ARC is just beyond a locked door, so we start hacking it as the countdown begins. And we're just desperately waiting for the doors to open as the doom clock gets closer to zero. Once the door is open, we start double timing it to the safety of the ARC. The proximity detector starts going frantic as super fast moving white dots appear on the map behind us. They're closing in incredibly quickly as we desperately try to reach the ARC. We make it to the vehicle as the gun starts blasting all around us. We jump from one side of the ARC to the other, trying as best we can to survive the xenomorphs while the heavy gun wears down their numbers. Neron barely survives, but survives he does. Harper has really saved our hides in this one. I may have to stop talking so much smack about him. This was absolutely epic, and I loved it. 
Now the bad part is that our old friend, the stress mechanic, has left our troops in a pretty bad state. So it's time to cut our losses and we're gonna evac. Then we have a pretty interesting event on the strategic layer. One of our rookies is expressing sympathy to the cult that we've just discovered. Apparently, this guy believes that dragging people off to implant an alien in their chest, which will then burst forth, killing them in one of the most gruesome deaths imaginable, is a logical outcome because of capitalist oppression. Better dead than red. Yeah, we're getting rid of this guy for sure. And look at the wording here. He was terminated. Does that mean he was fired or something more permanent? I'm not really sure, but even if we did just fire him, how does that work? Sorry bro, your services are no longer required. Pack your things and leave the ship. You just have to wander through several miles of alien infested hellscape to get to the nearest settlement, which has also been completely overrun by alien monstrosities. And I do have to wonder if this guy will still be feeling bad for the cultists when they strap him down and place a face hugger on his double digit IQ skull. But regardless, whatever this guy's fate was, I imagine it was not a good one. And I'm totally fine with that. Now by now we've promoted enough soldiers into non-rookie classes that I want to start putting some squads together who we can keep together for the rest of the game. So I decide I'm going to color code them to make it easier to tell who's part of the same team. And this turns out to be a surprisingly obnoxious process. See, you cannot customize your troops cosmetics or even purchase upgrades for them on the squad select screen. No, no, no. You have to go multiple screens back to the barracks to do that. This was really annoying. See, several of the upgrades are the same for all troops, like holding extra ammo, as an example. And what I really wanted was to be able to easily access the entire team at once to compare the upgrades they had. I don't want to give every member of the team more ammo, and then have no one on the squad with the ability that lets you carry more medkits, as an example. We want to diversify our abilities. So not being able to upgrade your team while having easy access to everyone else on the team is really annoying. Instead, you have to remember who else is on the squad, remember the upgrades that they have, and then choose the upgrades on your current soldier accordingly. It's just way more obnoxious and time consuming than it needs to be, and there's really no reason for it. But nonetheless, a new squad returns to the refinery, and we find a synth who we can actually recruit as an engineer. Now I was in two minds about doing this since the last synthetic we met was extremely evil, but nonetheless, this guy is on the ARC now, for better or worse. Then we head into the basement of the refinery and we find what's left of some unfortunate people who got grabbed by the cultists. Harper asks about a young woman and it's here I realize he has a daughter. Is there a girl in there? Anything more specific while we're at it, Sarge? She'd be uh, in her teenage years, blue eyes, and a nose like mine. Move on! And I love how the soldiers just say nothing and keep walking. Emotional support isn't what they're here for, I suppose. And then we meet a Praetorian Xenomorph. Now these things seem to run away from you while calling in reinforcements, but then at some stage they'll get sick of running away and they'll charge your marines. I guess they're kind of leading you into a trap. Now this specimen moves really fast and it's really annoying, but I think it's supposed to be annoying. So from that aspect, the design works really well. But you know what doesn't work? The tech class. See, Dark Hawk here, for some reason, has just decided he's going to stop attacking. At all. We're being bombarded with enemies and he's just chilling. Just wandering around, enjoying the view of the dank and depressing corridors full of monsters trying to eradicate us from existence. Now I can still tell him to open doors, use medkits and those sort of things, but using his weapon? Nah, that's not gonna happen. Maybe it was destroyed somehow? 
I don't even know if that's a mechanic in this game. We still had plenty of ammo, so it wasn't that. And even if we were out of ammo, he should still swap over to his secondary weapon anyway. So I don't know what's going on here. Now, earlier, I was trying to directly control his drone. Yeah, the tech class has access to a drone, and I'll talk more about that later. But maybe by trying to order the drone around, I've somehow broken how the character works. I'm not sure, but it does end up causing a reload. Having only three soldiers who can attack is just way too much of a handicap. Now thankfully, after the reload, Dark Hawk decides he's going to use his weapon again, so that's nice. And the fact that reloading solved the problem makes me think that it wasn't anything I did. It was just some weird glitch. So with four working soldiers, we can survive this ordeal, but our team is horribly traumatized, so it's time to evac once again. By now, I've nicknamed Neron to Kaz 2, and we were actually able to get rid of his initial trauma quite early with a promotion, so he's looking like a much better soldier to use now. So back to the refinery, we hear from Marlo, the leader of the cult. He scolds us over the radio and appears to know quite a bit about Harper's past. He tells us we've become too much of a nuisance, so he's going to have to take us out. We're trapped in the basement with the ARC, an endless horde of aliens charging down upon us. So Maiko decides she's going to turn the Otago's one and only long-range communication satellite into a homemade missile, by filling it with explosives and firing it into the refinery. And this was a pretty cool cutscene. Now see, the problem is that one satellite was the only means we had of off-world communication. It wasn't functional yet, but with it gone, we have no way of telling anyone what's happening on Lethe. And this is a significant chunk of character development for Maiko. Up until now, she's been butting heads with Harper, as he's been more focused on saving the people on Lethe, while Maiko's main priority has been getting the message of what's happening off the planet to keep the alien outbreak contained. So Maiko sacrificing that objective in order to save Harper and the crew is quite the power move on her behalf, and her relationship with Harper does improve moving forward. Now once the dropship returns to the Otago with everyone thankfully alive, the plot developments continue. Maiko has found out more intel about Marlo. He was a Wayland yutani scientist before he, you know, decided to quit his job and start an evil cult. Meanwhile, Harper reveals he's concerned about his estranged daughter, Cassandra. See, he has visions, as he calls them, allowing him to know what the aliens are thinking, and he's afraid if Cassandra shares this ability that he has, maybe the cult could be using Cassandra for their own purposes. And this is weird, honestly. Like, just throwing out that a character can essentially read the minds of the Xenomorphs, that's a really interesting idea there. How sentient are these creatures? What kind of thoughts would be going through their brains? Assuming they even have brains, as we understand the concept. But Harper never feels the need to elaborate on this for the entire game. Just a throwaway line about reading the minds of one of the coolest and most mysterious creatures in science fiction history. Yeah, that's not a big deal. No reason you'd want to explore that concept any further. Just say it once and then forget about it. There's so much wasted potential here. This could have been a really interesting idea. But all this exposition is interrupted by the base defense mission. Yeah, we always have to have one of those in these games. The A's are coming for the Otago, and it's up to the four hapless fools we're sending to the battlefield to keep them at bay. Now, in this mission, there is no evac. The whole thing needs to be completed by the first squad you send, and it's essentially an escort mission. One of your troops will use a power loader to move a heavy weapon into position to cut off the alien's advances. The rest of the squad needs to protect them while they do it, as the power loader is pretty much defenseless. But we are given a bit of extra help on this one. The dropship can launch a barrage fire. This is an absolutely devastating ability in which Hunslet, the pilot of the dropship, will completely annihilate anything that enters the blast zone. 
And even better, it only costs one command point to use, which is really cheap for the devastation that it can cause. Now you do have to be mindful, it doesn't activate immediately, so you do need to time it well. But if you can do that, the results are well worth the trouble. Now with the defenses in place, our troops can return to the Otago without needing to worry about being torn limb from limb in their sleep. So that's pretty cool. No time to celebrate avoiding a most gruesome end though, as Maiko and Harper receive a transmission from Director Price. She's the top Whalen yutani employee on Lethe, so I guess that kind of makes her the planet's ruler in a way. A corrupt, corpo, dystopian nightmare kind of way, but a way all the same. Now she's over in the settlement of Pharaoh Spire, I may be butchering the pronunciation of that one, and she has some pretty bad news for us. The Cerberus Protocol is about to enter its second phase, titled Nuclear Sterilization. Nuclear Sterilization? As in of the planet? This planet we're all stranded on. Price sent a team of Whalen yutani commandos to Pioneer Station in hopes of shutting down Phase 2 of the Protocol, but she's lost contact with the team. So you guessed it, that's where we come in. And Mission 4, or maybe 5 if you count the base defense, I think I've kind of lost count actually. Whatever, the point is, we're going to Pioneer Station. Or at least we would be if it weren't for the fact that our troops' morale is low. We can take a chance to make a flaming speech to try and inspire them, whatever that is. And I gotta tell you, I've heard a lot of speeches in my life. Flaming is not a descriptor I would use to describe any of them. But anyway, the problem is if the speech fails, our whole crew will become exhausted, which means they won't be able to deploy on any missions for several days. And even on days we don't deploy, the alien infestation level still increases. So I figure losing deployment for one day is the least terrible option. We're going to let our troops rest. And this leaves a pretty ridiculous scenario when you think about it. Like, hey everyone, we need to go to Pioneer Station, otherwise the entire planet is going to be plunged into nuclear hellfire. And the troops are just like, nah, I haven't had my nap time. Leave me alone. We'll go tomorrow. So anyway, once our soldiers are done lazing about, we can finally deploy. Latimer being a recon soldier means she gets a cool cape, but it's less cool when it glitches out and does this. I guess it's a poncho now. Anyway, once we're aboard the station, as you might expect, most of the corridors are pretty tight, so ARC support is going to be very limited on this one. Now by this time, I've learned to use the recon sniper rifle, which, with the right upgrade, allows you to silently take down an enemy at the cost of one command point. Now if you take down the alien before it spots you, it prevents the hunted state from activating. So the recon class is amazing. It's so nice to be able to clear out a patrolling enemy without having your character's stress go through the roof. Now, like I said earlier, using the sniper rifle does mean switching out the shotgun, so you can't use that, but that's what the rest of the team is for. Now, using the security cameras, we spot a dead Whalen yutani commando who may have an access key that we need. And I haven't spoken about this mechanic yet, but it's present on most levels. Somewhere on the map, you'll be able to access the feed from the security cameras, and they can often highlight areas of interest either something to move the story forward, or possibly an area with some nice loot that you might want to investigate. Now it varies, but it's a nice addition. Also, as we explore the Pioneer, we can actually find some data pads left by Maiko, giving us more insight into her character. If you care about that sort of thing, it's pretty neat, and I do appreciate the attention to detail, even if I'm not big on the data pads myself. So we make it to the end of the level, and there's a queen we're going to have to face. But there's a whole bunch of synthetics in the room too. And apparently the aliens do not attack synthetics. Looks like we found our queen. Right in the middle of the synth's maintenance center. Guess that confirms your theory on the creatures, Hayes. They're not even bothered by the androids. Now look, in the movies, the Xenomorphs would rip apart a synthetic just as quickly as anyone else. But I can accept this development given that these synthetics are a lot more robotic and less human than the synths in the films. 
Here's my real issue with this. We have synths. I mean, you can see the footage here as the battle begins. There's literally a synthetic with us who we found as a survivor. So why the hell aren't we using our synthetics to scout the area? Every single mission we could send some synthetics in first to have a look around. Provided they avoid any human enemies, they'll be completely safe. They could gather a huge amount of intel before we send in the human troops. Imagine having a spy that is literally invisible to your enemy and choosing not to deploy them. This is so unbelievably stupid. We're here getting our stress meter up to 40% from a single alien when we could be sending in a platoon of essentially invulnerable and invisible synths to do our job for us. And there's no doubt in my mind the only reason the developers chose to make the aliens ignore synthetics is to have a stupid, nonsensical set piece like this one. It just feels so gamey. The Darwin era cultists actually deploy synthetics on some missions to block our progress, but we couldn't possibly dream of doing the same thing to them. Nah, that would make too much sense. So, whatever. This really annoyed me, but the Queen is dead and we can move on with our lives. So let's disable that Cerberus Protocol Phase 2 and get the heck out of this stank hole, shall we? Unable to compute. Infestation has reached critical level. What? Option to override Cerberus Protocol Phase 2 has expired. Oh, never mind. We can't. Such an option has expired. Expired. Maybe if all our troops hadn't insisted on spending several days sitting around feeling sorry for themselves, we wouldn't all be about to be blown away in nuclear hellfire right now. Thanks, Marines. Thanks a bunch. Now look, I know that even if we had deployed straight away, this still would have happened. That's just how the story of the game is going to play out. But man, does this game's insistence on not letting you actually deploy your troops really make this look like a comedy of errors? If only we had shut down the nuclear Armageddon protocol instead of playing video games all day, then maybe we could have lived. Yeah, okay. So with no hope of stopping the phase 2 of the Cerberus protocol, the crew turned their attention to trying to repair the Otago, and somehow outrunning the missiles that blew the ship into near rubble in the first place. Desperate times and all that, I suppose. But even as they're babbling about repairing the ship, not one of them mentions the ship that we saw at the docks. Couldn't we at least investigate that vessel to see if it's flight worthy? I mean, it didn't look like it had massive gaping holes in the side that'll suck us into space, so that's probably a decent upgrade over the Otago to me. But no, none of the characters even mention it. I'm starting to think none of these people even want to survive. Now here, Director Price makes us a deal, and it's kind of important we pay attention to the details, because I am going to return to this later. So she asks for her and her employees to be given safe passage aboard the Otago. And in exchange for this, she promises to recover Harper's daughter, Cassandra, who she assures us is still alive. Price tells us the location of a power generator that may be able to keep the Otago's shields intact just long enough to escape Lethe's orbit before the Cerberus Protocol missiles annihilate us. Again, and just to reiterate, in exchange for Cassandra, Price wants herself and her employees to have safe passage on the Otago. I must stress this here. And then we have some real garbage. Look at this. 25 days until orbital bombardment. Yep, it's a doom clock. Because, of course, every one of these games has to have a Doom Clock. Just like XCOM 2 and the Avatar Project, or Phoenix Point and the human population, we always need an arbitrary timer to hurry us along. But this, my good people, may be the absolute worst Doom Clock I've ever encountered. Now, I've hesitated to call Aliens Dark Descent a bad game up until now, but this thing right here... This is absolutely bad game design. 
And the devs must have agreed with me because I believe in the latest version of the game, you actually have the option to disable the Doom Clock. Yeah, disabled by the developers, that's how bad it is. Now what makes it so bad? Well, we'll get to that. But first, let's just consider what is going on here. From an in-universe perspective, I mean. The Doom Clock has 25 days on it, at which time the Cerberus Protocol will activate the nuclear option and scorch the entire planet. But what kind of sense does this make? Why wait 25 days? We tried to disable the protocol and we can't. So if the nuclear missiles are going to be fired anyway, why not just launch them now? It's not like someone is going to come along in 25 days, realise a mistake has been made and shut the protocol down. And we know no one is going to do that because that's exactly what we just tried to do. If even Director Price, the boss of the entire planet, doesn't have the authority to shut the protocol down, then no one will. So wouldn't the Cerberus Protocol just launch the missiles straight away? Does it take 25 days to power them up? That would be the least efficient energy system ever created. Does the Cerberus Protocol just want to give the outbreak as much time as possible to get underground and avoid the nuclear blast? Is it meant to give the survivors time to get off the planet? But the whole point of the protocol is to stop anyone and anything from leaving the planet. We'll get blown up if we try to leave. Nothing about this makes any sense. It really feels like the developers just saw similar games with Doom Clocks and decided to put one into theirs to follow trends. And they put absolutely zero thought into making the Doom Clock actually fit the game's narrative. I mean, the infestation level was enough of an incentive to make me hurry my way through the game. Why do we need this extra thing that makes absolutely zero sense from a story perspective? I mean, if you were so set on having a Doom Clock, you could have just tied it to the infestation level. If the number of aliens on the planet gets too high, then the Otago's defences won't be able to hold them off, and our base will get overrun. So, it really just doesn't make sense. But see, this isn't even my biggest problem with this stupid mechanic. No, my biggest problem is the next day we get another event where our troops have low morale. Yeah, we just had one of these, and now there's another one straight away. Now at this point, I have no idea how tight or forgiving the Doom Clock is going to be. Now spoiler alert, it's actually not too punishing, and you should have ample time to complete the game before the Doom Clock expires. But like I said in my first playthrough, I didn't know that. As far as I'm concerned, we may need every single one of those 25 days. So I opt to make a flaming speech because in my mind, we really can't afford to miss a day of deployment. Well, the speech fails, of course, and the whole roster is now exhausted. So this means not only can we not deploy today, we can't deploy the next day either because everyone is too tired. Unless... See... We do have this one guy, Thorn, in the infirmary, and he was injured when we got the event, and any injured troops are immune to the effects of the low morale event. So we can use our physicians to heal him and then send him out into the field alone. Now for the record, if you do decide to play this game, sending a single soldier on a mission is a horrible idea and you should never do so under any circumstances. See, the biggest problem I run into is that Marines can't actually heal themselves. They can apply a med kit to other Marines, but not to their own person. So one encounter with some Xenomorphs nearly wipes us out. So pretty much as soon as we arrived, it's time to leave. Now Thorn did manage to complete the first primary objective, so it wasn't a total waste. That's something. You go, Thorn. So maybe the next day we'll be able to deploy some people, right? Nope. We get a third low morale event. Again, I try to make a speech, and again, it fails. And here, I just end up reloading, and we thankfully get a different random event. So not only are we having to reload on the tactical layer, but now also the strategic layer. And the fact that I have to do this is pathetic. What kind of sadist introduces a Doom Clock and then just spams you with events that make deploying on missions impossible? This is just completely broken. 
Even Darkest Dungeon, for all the nonsense that game throws at you, at least lets you play the game. Here, it's day 22 by the time I can deploy an actual team on the mission. And that's only because I reloaded. Without doing that, it would have been day 21 or 20. That's one-fifth of the Doom Clock gone before the game will even let me do anything. And this isn't even a challenge. This is the equivalent of playing a fighting game, but your opponent steals your controller just as the fight starts. So, I've got a couple of things to say here. One, maybe don't have a mechanic that locks the player out of playing the game. Two, if you are going to lock the player out of playing the game, maybe set it so that that particular event only happens very rarely, not twice in two days. And thirdly, if you are going to have it spam twice in two days, maybe don't have it happen just after you introduce the Doom Clock and not playing the game will literally cause the player to automatically lose the whole campaign without any possibility of countering the loss. I mean, at that point, it's not even a game. It's just like a movie. A movie that just mocks you and laughs at you and tells you you suck as you face defeat. Like I said, worst Doom Clock I've ever come across. And even more than that, one of the worst mechanics in any game I've ever come across. This is a joke. And I know someone is going to say I'm being too hard on the game because you can disable the Doom Clock now. And I get it, it's good that the devs are listening to player feedback and taking it on board. But here's the thing. If the feature was so bad it had to be patched out of the game in the very first month, why was it ever there in the first place? Really seems like there was not enough quality assurance done on this game. I mean, I cannot express how infuriated I was here, and it really soured my mood on the whole game for the rest of the playthrough. Having such a negative effect applied to the player needs to be given a lot of consideration to ensure it's balanced. And that was simply not the case when I played this game. Horrible, horrible mechanics on display here. Speaking of horrible mechanics, here's an alien that spawns right on top of us. Oh joy. And you'll see here I just immediately reload. The previous shenanigans have put me in a truly foul mood and I have zero interest in tolerating any more of it. If the game wasn't so punishing with the hunting mechanic, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But it is. So it is. If that makes sense. Now the game mentions three survivors in the area but warns us they may be Darwin-era cultists. There's apparently clues about their identities in the living quarters, but I'm not entirely sure where that is, and I really can't be bothered looking. So we come across this woman, and she mentions Marlow. She apparently based her research on some of his work. So we're then given the option of recruiting her, or executing her. No option to leave her here and return once we have the intel on her. Nah, we couldn't be applying any logic to the situation. Heck, we could just leave her in the ARC until we find the intel. But no, that's not an option either. So just make sure you find the intel before stumbling across this random person. And if you don't do that, well, just flip a coin, I guess. Should be fine, right? Now, I figure shooting someone just because they said Marlowe's name is a pretty extreme reaction, even for me. So we're going to let her live. The next guy, though. I mean, look at this. He's standing next to a dead body inside a room with an alien nest. And he welded himself inside this room for the record. Now, he tries convincing us his friend was infected by a facehugger, and that's why he had to finish him. But I'm not buying it. This guy seems as evil as they come. Who welds themselves inside a room with an alien nest? So yeah, this guy's going down. There is a third survivor somewhere on the map, but I never found him. But I did find evidence that he was in the cult, so I don't think I missed much. 
And then we have a bit of an unexpected hiccup. An alien has died on the map terminal where we would normally download the map of the area and it's destroyed it with its acidic blood. So we're not gonna have a map for this mission. Now, once we explore an area, it does still show up on our map, but we can't get a full layout of the area like we could on previous missions. So just a nice little twist to increase the difficulty a little bit. And speaking of difficulty, I end up resetting a lot here. Pretty much whenever I get an unwanted engagement with the Xenomorphs. Given how many days of progress we've lost, I'm wanting to make huge advancements in this mission on our first real deployment. And that means keeping our stress levels low and ammo supplies high. And given how cheap some of the alien spawn points are on this one, there's quite a few reloads. Again, if we had been able to deploy on the mission straight away, I wouldn't be so concerned about it but I'm wanting every encounter to go perfectly to avoid increasing stress, increasing the alien difficulty level, and wasting ammo. And I'm really not articulate enough to do justice to how truly miserable this experience was. It's been a while since I enjoyed a game less than the hot garbage that this one has been throwing at me just now. Then we randomly encounter a new ARC, and the team gets in it and drives away. Now, I didn't want them to do this, and I was given zero indication it was going to happen. We just walk into a random room, and the squad's like, all right, let's call it a day. New wheels, let's go. So that's another day of the Doom Clock that has been wasted with no way for me to prevent it, apart from reloading, of course. And I don't know when the last time the game saved was, I certainly don't want to replay any of this horrible mission if I don't have to. So we're just going to go with it, I guess. Now, there is some good news, which I desperately need at this point, because I was really considering just giving up on the game here. Everything since the Doom Clock activated has been some of the worst gameplay, or lack thereof, I've ever experienced. And I've been playing video games since the early 90s. Anyway, the good news, let's stay on topic. This new vehicle allows us to field five soldiers on the team. Now that is awesome. So I was pretty optimistic about this, but in record speed, we're almost completely out of ammo and all our Marines are approaching maximum stress levels. So yeah, I guess that extra guy didn't make too much of a difference. So we're in a boss fight, having been reduced to handguns. And the handguns suck. You can get better secondary weapons, but A, they're expensive, and B, you need to have a high enough level soldier to unlock them. So it takes a few reloads and finding some ammo on the map, but eventually we win. There's these annoying electrical discharges and you're supposed to lure the queen into the blast as an easy way to take her down. But given the average xenomorphs move so quickly in relation to the marines, the electricity ends up being far more threatening to us than them. So it's a pretty horrible experience, but like I said, we do eventually win, it just takes a while. And with the power core for the Otago in hand, we can finally leave this wretched level. Now here we learn Harper's health is beginning to deteriorate. He's hunched over and looking as miserable as that last mission made me feel. And the characters also make a big deal of our new vehicle here, the APC. I have no idea what these letters stand for, for the record. But Bald Guy here tells us we can now deploy five troops, even though we literally just did that. So I'm guessing we bumped into the APC and discovered it before we were meant to. And that's why nothing that the characters are saying makes any sense whatsoever right now. The Doctor theorizes that the increasing presence of the aliens on the planet is the cause of Harper's deteriorating health. But to be honest, I'm pretty sure it's just the inclusion of the Doom Clock. I feel you, Harper. It drains a man, both body and a soul. So the next step is to get a gas mixing chip 
for the hypersleep module or something like that. It's actually kind of funny. The subtitles use a different term than the spoken dialogue. And the thing is, the alien universe is kind of interesting in that space travel is actually quite slow. So you might be on an interstellar journey that's going to take a hundred years. For that time, the crew is put into a type of cryostasis where they don't age and they can be awakened once the journey is complete. But we need a gas chip for the stasis chambers to work. And finally, Harper remembers the other ship we saw all that time ago, the Montero. Price reveals to us that Marlow is a former Wayland yutani employee, which we already knew by this stage, but she warns us that the Darwin era cultists are likely all over the Montero. So we're gonna have to murder our way through, I guess. All right, I'm up for this, let's do it. Are you kidding me? These things are literally popping up every second day. I honestly think having an alien burst out of my chest would be less painful than playing this game. Oh, never mind, the speech actually worked this time. I think that's a first for the whole playthrough. Cool. So we return to Berkeley's dock, which was the second mission, but we have access to a new area this time. A lift that will take us down to the Montero. And we get this awesome panning shot before we begin our descent. Yeah, get it? Now aboard the ship, we have both aliens and cultists to deal with, and those tanky boys with baby aliens inside them are showing up pretty regularly down here. There is a secondary objective to restore the ship's power. I'm guessing that would make it so that we could actually see rather than this pitch black nightmare scape. But I feel like activating the ship's power would be helping the Darwin era as they apparently want to use the ship to escape Lethe. So it seems I haven't given up on the narrative just yet. And here is where things get truly, truly awful. I haven't really talked much about the different classes up until now, but as we do know, one of the classes, and it is easily the worst of the classes, is the tech. This thing is not only a useless pile of garbage, it seems to actively sabotage you on missions. Remember earlier at the refinery when Darkhawk randomly stopped attacking? Yeah, he's a tech. Now the tech has a drone which can hack encrypted doors. And these doors often give you shortcuts through the mission that can make things easier or give you access to loot. But here's the thing, the other classes have a chance of gaining the hacking ability as an attribute. So trust me when I say you're way better off just trying to get another soldier who can hack and forego the tech class completely. These guys are not worth the time or the space on the squad. See, for some reason, Zionzi's drone has moved away from the squad. You can see it here on the map. Our troops are the green circles and the drone is the blue circle. Now at this stage, I have no idea what I did to send the drone into a room that we haven't even reached yet, but somehow I've managed it. Now again, I didn't even realize the drone had left the team, not at first. The characters are pretty small on screen and the drone is really small. So we're just exploring our way through the level when all of a sudden I hear this gunfire. Now I actually thought it was some random sentry guns that were on the map. It was only while watching the footage back to write this script that I now realize it was the drone that was shooting. And apparently because the drone is part of our squad, having seen the drone, the enemies now automatically know where the rest of the team is. Now there's absolutely zero way they should know where we are, seeing as we're in a completely separate room and not making any noise, but they know all the same, and they're coming for us. And it reminds me of that XCOM 2 style of nonsense, where having line of sight on one of your soldiers magically gives advent line of sight on your whole squad, provided they're not in concealment, of course. And yes, that is how XCOM 2 works. And yes, it sucks in that game as well. So the cultists and aliens annihilate the drone in two seconds and then make a beeline for our position. 
and just listen to what one of our marines has to say. It's seen us! Like, mate, they knew exactly where you were long before they saw you. These guys were in a different room to us. Solid steel walls separating us and them, but spotting a drone gives them the magic knowledge of the whole squad's whereabouts. And I was wondering, like, how far could you test this? If the drone was in the opposite corner of the level, could you watch on the map as these cultists do an Olympic marathon through the whole stage, crisscrossing through corridors to make the most expedient trip to your position? It's kind of something that I'd like to test if I didn't have literally anything else better to do with my time. And this nonsense causes so many enemies to descend on us that our stress levels completely blow out and the alien's difficulty level increases. I was so annoyed and confused that I just reloaded. Now the second time, I moved to the next room over again. So now the cultists are two rooms between us and them when the drone attacks them. And just look at what happens. They make a beeline through the first two rooms, open the doors to where we are, and begin the battle. So the moment these guys spot the drone, they know where everyone else is. Now this makes zero sense. And so as I'm writing this script, I figure let's go back and check some of the earlier footage. Now this is our team as we spawn in the elevator of the Montero. Now, I know it's dark and tough to see, but the drone isn't actually with us. This, meanwhile, is the footage of just outside at the docks. And this is what it looks like when the drone is with the squad. It's small, but you can see it hovering along with the tech. Now, that's not happening inside the ship. And again, this is the moment we spawned into the area. I had no control over the troops. And the first time I open the map inside the Montero, you can see the blue dot. The drone has already left us. So it was with us before we took the elevator down, but the moment we arrived on the ship, the drone relocated to a new position. And the reason I'm emphasizing this and taking so much time is because I want to make it really clear, I did not tell the drone to leave the squad. And researching this issue, it seems to be common for multiple players. The drone is simply bugged on this level. So that leaves us with some broader implications to consider. The game punishes you heavily for going in loud against the aliens. You want to remain stealthy in order to avoid stress and the alien aggressiveness increasing. Remember, when it gets too high, boss level aliens can just randomly show up on the map. Not to mention all the traumas that can potentially drastically lower your marine's combat effectiveness. You're incentivized to remain in stealth. And so what we're left with here is a stealth game in which stealth is totally broken. A stealth game in which enemies automatically know where you are because they saw a drone in a completely different location when you didn't even order the drone to be there in the first place. My soldiers didn't shoot, didn't run, didn't cause any noise at all. But because of this stupid glitched out drone, the enemies just immediately swarm us and there's nothing I can do to prevent it. And there's really bigger issues with the stealth mechanics in general. See, you can use a sniper to kill an alien without making noise. And if the alien hasn't spotted you, you're sweet. But if the alien does spot you in the instant before its death, even if none of the troops with the loud guns actually fired, the aliens still enter hunting mode. They'll begin moving on your position because one xenomorph saw you for a millisecond before it dropped dead from a silenced shot. And again, if that silenced shot had been one millisecond faster, well then the aliens have no idea where you are. So that's the rules that our squad has to play by, but let's compare this to the ARC or the turrets that we can place on the map. Those things never get hunted. Enemies don't begin homing in on their location. And let's ask the question, why don't they do this? And the obvious answer is because it would be too OP. If sentry guns could draw enemies to their location, 
they would be an extremely powerful distraction. Something that could both draw enemies away from your squad and also kill those very same enemies so you don't have to worry about them later. Now that would be awesome. But of course the sentry guns don't do this. The aliens magically know if the bullets they heard flying were from a sentry gun or a cultist's gun or a marine's rifle. And they only choose to diverge on the location if it's a marine's rifle. Anything else they just don't care about. I mean, let's just consider this game's logic. You could just deploy 20 sentry guns over the whole level and blow every single thing that walks past them into mush. And that would cause less of a reaction from the aliens than one of them spotting you for an instant as its head explodes from a silent sniper shot. What kind of logic is that? It really makes no sense, and it leaves the player in a position where one set of rules applies to us, but it's a totally different set of rules for everything else in the game. And I really hate that in games. It's immersion breaking, it isn't fair, I don't find it fun, it doesn't make sense. And in this case, it doesn't even work properly because a drone creating noise two rooms over magically tells all the bad guys where your actual team was, who were being completely silent. So we end up with a game that punishes you for not being stealthy, but makes being stealthy near impossible. And this problem only became even more frustrating for me as the game progressed, but I'll get into that in time. As for now, like I said, I highly recommend not using the tech class at all. It's a literal broken class and not in a good way. And the other thing to remember as I say all this is that you cannot manually save wherever you want. So I hope you decided to rest up before the game decided to throw a totally broken mechanic at you. Because if you didn't, you're going to have to replay a huge chunk of the level just to avoid getting screwed over by broken mechanics. But it gets even better than that, because I did have one instance where I rested the team, but the game didn't actually save. Again, apparently this glitch has happened to a few people. So in order to save, you have to rest. Now this requires you to be in the right location with a room where resting is actually permitted, and once you've found that room, you have to use resources to seal it so that you can use it to rest. And even when you do all this, the game isn't guaranteed to save because it just may not work properly. Now this only happened once that I noticed, but I couldn't tell you how many times it actually happened in reality. There could have been multiple instances where the game didn't save, and I just didn't know because I never tried to reload to that point. So to recap, the game punishes you for not being stealthy, but being stealthy is at times impossible because the game's mechanics don't function correctly. This means you either get screwed over through no fault of your own, or you have to reload. But if you have to reload, remember you can't manually save, so reloading is going to send you back to the last autosave, and the autosave doesn't always work. This entire system is abysmal. So anyway, rant over, for now at least. We've got the gas mixing chip, we can leave the Montero and never return, and that's all really good, but turns out this hideous looking cultist is a stowaway on our APC. I guess he didn't have a drone to give away his position. Now he implies that Cassandra is some kind of saintly figure in the Darwin era, and he invites Harper to join the cult. And apparently this offer comes from Marlowe directly. Yeah, you know, after Marlowe said that Harper was a nuisance and he wanted to kill him. So, whatever. The cultist gets locked up in a holding cell for his troubles. And you tell me, and I'm not just saying this, I really mean it. Pause the video and post in the comments. I'm curious to know. And it'll help with the algorithm, so you'll be doing me a solid. But genuinely, how long do you think that cell is going to keep the cultist contained? Yeah, just pause the video, let me know your guesses in the comments section, and then hit the play button again. And we'll just see. Also, I love the cultist's voice. Cassandra has opened our minds to the hive. Through her voice, we understand their purpose. With her guidance, we feel what they feel. 
This guy looks like an absolute monstrosity, a demon dragged up from the pits of hell itself. And then he just has the voice of Ben from accounting or something. I found this really funny. Then the alien in him bursts out of his chest and he dies. Anyway, we're talking to Price again and she tells us that the man she sent to track Cassandra, a guy named Stern, well he's gone AWOL in an underground research facility. So you know the drill. Yep, we've got low morale again. You thought I was going to say it's time to deploy on a mission, didn't you? Ah, you should know better by now. That's not how we do things in this game. You want to play the game? Nah, man, you gotta wait. So yeah, it's another day that we can't deploy, and the Doom Clock is going to count down even further. So when the game finally lets us play the game again, we can head out to Tantalus Research Station. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And maybe I'll talk about the other classes while Past Drifter is deploying for the mission. Like I said, Recons can swap their shotgun for a sniper rifle, and you want to make getting the silencer upgrade on the sniper rifle a priority. It makes the Recons the best unit in the game. Sort of, but I'll talk more about that later. Now Gunners are your heavies. They can carry a bigger rifle, which you can deploy it as a sentry gun and doing so will force the gunner to use their secondary weapon until you pick the rifle back up. But the really useful thing they get is an ability that slows down enemy movement while they're being hit by suppressive fire. So this can really slow down the xenomorphs in their tracks. It's definitely worth picking that one up in my opinion. There's also the Medic. Now he doesn't start off too useful, but they can get an upgrade later that lets a med kit heal both HP and distress at the same time. Without that ability, you have to choose to spend the med kit either on HP or stress, not both. Now the stress reduction is reduced if you choose both, but it's still quite useful. And then there's the Sergeant, basically the team leader. These guys are really useful for giving you more command points. So always nice to have one of them on your team. We launch an assault on the research station and it's pretty hectic here. We're constantly swarmed with aliens, but we do once again have the dropship's guns to back us up. And this is a really cool section of the game. Like our marines are storming the shores of Normandy to create a safe deployment zone. We're just forcing our way slowly up the mountainside, annihilating all the enemy emplacements we encounter. And the music while we're doing this is appropriately epic. Shit, it's coming to us! Contact! Bring him down! Really cool stuff here. Now once we arrive at the entrance to the base, the door is locked, as you'd expect, and I spend a fair amount of time trying to find an ulterior entrance, only to realise there's another unlocked door right in front of me. And I felt pretty ridiculous for missing this. Now inside the base, cultists and xenomorphs everywhere. I don't think stealth is really meant to be an option at this point, and that makes sense. No doubt these guys have been watching us as we battle their way to their front door. Instead, we just need to punch our way through all the resistance we come across. Also, I'll mention here, I have equipped some of our soldiers with heavy pulse rifles. These inflict more damage than the regular pulse rifle, but they don't have the built-in grenade launcher. So I'd advise keeping the regular rifle on at least a couple of your troops as you definitely want access to grenades. Especially since we now have an upgrade, the grenades will slow the movement of aliens caught in the blast zone. So grenades are just really useful and you want to have access to them. I mean, check this out. There's this corridor where the bad guys have set a fortified position. Now meanwhile, there's absolutely no cover anywhere for us, and being able to spam grenades into their lines is the only thing keeping us alive. Now all this commotion has triggered a massive onslaught, so we're going to be having a lot of xenomorphs incoming. The good news is we've unlocked that initial front entrance to the base that we came across, so we can easily jump back into the APC which is waiting right outside. 
I thought this would be a great strategy, let the APC eliminate the swarm for us. But it turns out I was wrong. See, the plan doesn't really work. The APC is just a bit too fast for the aliens to keep up with. So it kind of outruns them as we drive down the mountain, meaning that it can't shoot at any of them. But the really bad part is it only outruns them just enough for the aliens to descend upon us while we're exiting the APC and cannot defend ourselves very well. And the problem is once our squad is inside the vehicle, we can only stay in there until we reach our destination. There's no way to just hide inside the APC indefinitely. Now again, this only serves to make our marines look really dumb. Like instead of staying inside the vehicle with the huge gun that will annihilate the threat, the marines decide just to run out there like a bunch of idiots. Now I try to get the marines back into the APC as quickly as possible, but the problem is to enter the transport, you have to select a point on the map you want the APC to ferry your troops to. And the game doesn't pause while the map is open. Like even if you use the stop time feature, once you open the map, time will resume and the aliens will continue attacking you. And in the handful of seconds it takes to open the map and choose our next deployment zone with the APC, Kaz 2 gets concussed and is now unconscious. And just the speed with which this happened was insane. In fact, it happened so quickly that I don't actually realize Kaz has been downed until we're halfway back up the mountain. So we're gonna have to travel back down. And Zionzi gets jumped while we're doing this, so now he's down too. So things are going pretty badly, but you can see an even better strategy than riding in the APC. Get your soldiers in front of it and then command the APC to move. As long as your troops stay on the path the APC is trying to take, it'll get stuck behind them. This way the marines can still shoot and use all their abilities, but you also have the APC's firepower backing you up. Now it is limited as the APC will only travel along certain routes, but it can be very useful in certain situations. But anyway, given how badly this whole scenario has gone, I opt for a reload. This time I decide to deal with the onslaught inside the base. Can't go any worse than last time, right? So we lay down sentry guns and suppressive fire all over the place and you can see the devastation here. Between the suppression of the heavies and the grenades, the aliens are getting slowed to a crawl and we're just obliterating them. And as cool as this display of carnage may look, and it does look very cool, I'll give you that, you do have to remember, our stress levels and the alien difficulty level are both increasing this entire time. And it's honestly a really weird design choice. Like the game gives us all these really cool items and abilities that we can use to unleash total devastation but then it heavily penalizes us for using these tools. It's like the game wants to dangle having fun in front of us, but then do everything it can to discourage us from actually doing so. Just so much wasted potential here. Now upon making it to the top of the base, we learned there's actually a secret research lab under the base. So that's where we're going. And it's another power loader escort section. And check this one out, Latimer gets stuck on the APC. So I'm forced to abandon the power loader, move the whole team back to get Latimer unstuck, and then proceed back down the mountain to the power loader. Turnabout is fair play, I guess. We cause the APC to get stuck on the soldiers, now the APC is doing the same thing to us. And this issue does come up from time to time, not just with the APC, but sometimes one of your troops will get stuck on an object and just get left behind. Now if we could individually control each member of the squad, this would be a very easy problem to fix. We could just control that one person to path around the object and then return to the squad. But because there is no individual control, only control of the entire group, it becomes a way more annoying problem than it has any right to be. We use the power loader to open the entrance to the underground lab, 
and it's here I decide to switch to a fresh team. So inside we find several holding cells. Now we can either just start opening doors or we can read the data pad to get some information about what's behind each one. And based on the descriptions, it sounds like some of these doors we definitely do not want to open. However, in one cell is a prisoner, Stern, the commando who is tracking Cassandra. More plot armor on display as we open the cell mere seconds before he's about to get face hugged. So that was convenient. Stern makes his way to the surface while we continue searching for Cassandra. Marlow continually ridicules us over the intercom system as we head further into the lab. And soon we actually learn that Stern had no idea he was looking for a girl. He thought the name Cassandra was some kind of code word. So Price has apparently deceived him for some reason. Like why would Price lie about this? Just to have a stereotypical evil executive who we shouldn't trust? I don't know, I don't understand. Anyway, we're able to finally spot Cassandra through the security cameras, and yeah, it doesn't look real good for her. Marlo is banging on about his evil plans, assuring Cassandra that she's helping create a better world. Just the usual villain stuff. But it turns out the footage we're watching is apparently an old recording, so Cassandra is no longer here in the base, she's been moved. The goose chase continues. Marlo is still here though, and we get our hands on him, so that's something. The base's self-destruct sequence has been activated, so we have to very quickly escort the mad scientist to the surface before everything, including us, goes boom. We make it out just in time where Harper is understandably upset with Marlo. But here's the thing, the cult leader informs us he didn't actually trigger the self-destruct. That was Price. Yeah, the Weyland yutani executive was evil all along. I'm truly shocked. Who could have predicted this? Honestly, it would have been more of a twist if Price actually ended up being one of the good guys. Anyway, Marlow tells us that Price simply wanted the data from his research, and the moment that we transferred a copy to the Otago, Price triggered the self-destruct to get rid of us. Now, there's a few issues I have with this turn of events, but we'll get to those in a moment. In the meantime, Harper uses some extreme interrogation methods, and he just shoots Marlow in the kneecap. What a legend. And it's here we learn that Marlow isn't actually Marlow at all. He's a synthetic, just a copy of the real Marlow. The synth goads Harper into ending him, which Harper happily goes along with. And then Harper loses consciousness, his growing health problems finally catching up with him. Alright, so we're back on the Otago and we have a very important game to play and I'm excited about this one. So all of you watching the video, you're in the hot seat right now. Think back to your prediction about the alien cultist. Did you say he would escape from his holding cell five seconds after being captured? One mission after being captured? Until the end of the game? until the end credits to establish an unnecessary sequel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you chose option B, one mission after being captured, you were correct. So congratulations to everyone who chose option B. Now, I know, technically the alien escaped, not the cultist, but the point remains, this was so obvious. And speaking of obvious, guess how the alien escaped? Yeah, this dude Becker, who was obviously evil from like five minutes after we met him, he releases the xenomorph and then he runs for the hills. Or the escape pod, I guess. And actually, that's a good question. How the heck did he plan to escape? I believe there's only one working dropship on the Otago, and we've already sent it to the research station. 
I mean, surely if we had other dropships, we'd be sending more Marines on each mission. Then again, they're all having low morale problems, so maybe we wouldn't. Whatever, it's time for mission nine, and it's another game of hide and seek with Maiko, because that was so much fun the first time. But hey, at least we were allowed to deploy on the mission. We didn't have a low morale event, so that's something, I guess. I gotta take the wins where I can. In this part of the game, it's pretty much exactly the same as the tutorial. Just trial and error, learn where the alien is gonna walk before it walks there, and then place yourself in the appropriate position to not be detected. Very mediocre stuff. So we lure the creature back into its cell, and we light that sucker up. Maiko is an exceptionally violent person when she wants to be, and I like that. So the door opens, the quarantine procedures finish, everything is good, what the f***, it's still alive. How? How on earth is it still alive? We literally smothered it in molten hot flames. It's not even phased. It's not scarred or scratched. It's not moving more slowly. The fire had literally no effect on it. And this is in a franchise where one of the most iconic weapons is a flamethrower. And not only is it still alive, but why on earth did the quarantine procedures finish? The door just automatically unlocks before anyone has even confirmed if the creature is alive or dead? That's the most useless quarantine procedure in the world. In the universe. In the multiverse. Nothing about this makes any sense. Why is this level even in the game? It's not fun to play, and the story is just... I mean, it's not even a plot hole. It... I don't know what it is. It's like a plot chasm. So now that the alien is out and about, Dr. Bookard then gets more slaughtered than my brain cells trying to understand what the heck just happened in this game. And I love how the alien just totally ignores the injured personnel on the infirmary beds, because that's totally what it would do in that situation. It wouldn't violently attack them. Nah, the alien's just like, I'm not gonna interrupt their beauty sleep. I may be a monster of pure violence, but I'm not a jerk. Anyway, now we have another game of hide and seek, and it's just as monotonous as all the previous ones were. Except this one's probably even worse because the sequence lasts longer. And as this is going down, I'm just asking the question, why is any of this even happening? It's one alien. Our marines have slaughtered hundreds of these things by now. And don't give me some excuse about the ship being locked down. We've been welding, exploding, and hacking our way through locked doors the entire game. This alien should be dead in two seconds. I mean, why weren't there armed guards outside its cell? They could have shot it dead instantly the moment it escaped. This is infuriating. All right, now we're getting serious. Some Weyland yutani commandos arrive on the Otago with plans of taking over the ship. And I guess this was Becker's plan, escape with these guys. Seems pretty risky though. What if they had been delayed? He'd be alien chowder right now. But whatever, why am I even still asking these questions at this point? Now, Maiko is able to sneak past the commandos and reach the ARC. Yeah, our original transport vehicle. It's a good thing we just came across a second one, which meant this one was left behind on the ship. Now, that's not contrived at all. And she once again goes full psychopath mowing down the commandos. I love it. But here's the thing, Wayland yutani they've got a psychopath on their own who activates the dropship's guns. Now somehow our little ARC defeats the much bigger, more heavily armoured dropship. Maiko's plot armour never fades. Becker shows up and points at our girl. He gives us his reason for betraying the entire Otago crew. He owed Wayland yutani money. Yeah, he was in debt, and Price will waive his debt if he assists her in securing Marlo's data and the Otago. But see, Becker, in his infinite wisdom, he's forgotten about Maiko's plot armor. 
And he's also forgotten that he unleashed a killer alien on the ship mere minutes ago. So yeah, he's gone. I mean, he's done giving us exposition, so the plot didn't need him anymore. Might as well kill him off instantly. And now it's a third game of hide and seek with this alien, and this time we're going to try to lure it into an electric field of this power generator. What kind of power generator just has loose bolts of electricity blasting all over the room anyway? Seems like an OH&S issue. And the other thing is, like, if a literal barrage of purifying fire didn't so much as scratch this thing, what do you think some electric discharge is going to do? I don't know. The idea is to call out to the alien to cause it to run at you in time for the electricity to fire off and vaporize it. Hopefully, might be totally immune to that as well. Now, I thought I had timed it perfectly. There's a countdown of 10 before the electricity fires off. But I'm wrong. The timing is totally messed up here. See, dialogue continues playing even if you freeze time in the game. And the electricity going off is tied to the dialogue, not the actual countdown. So even though I think I've timed things perfectly, because I froze the game, the electricity fires too quickly before the alien has even entered the danger zone. Of course, this does work the other way around as well. Rebooting reactor in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6... Come at me, you bitch! Four, three, two, one. Yeah, as long as the countdown has started, you can just lure the alien in, freeze time, and the alien has zero chance of escape. It's just stuck in a time bubble, allowing you to cheese the absolute heck out of this encounter. And look, the alien even stays dead this time. How good's that? The dropship returns in time to be no help whatsoever, and Harper is in some kind of coma, I guess. But luckily for us, Stern has just arrived in time to replace him as APC support. We're going to Pharaoh Spire to get revenge on Price, I guess. I mean, the team is looking for Cassandra, and we kind of think Price might know where she is. But why would we think that? If even Marlowe's synthetic clone doesn't know where Cassandra is, why on earth would Price have that information? Unless the synthetic was lying and Harper is just an idiot, I guess. We don't know it was those creatures. Could be an uprising, could be anything. Nuclear sterilization. As in of the planet? This planet we're all stranded on. But anyway, at this point, I'd just like us to stop and consider Price's actions at this point in time. She made a deal with us that we would allow her and her employees safe travel on the Otago in exchange for her providing us the location of Cassandra. She then proceeds to send Stern to the location that Cassandra was at, not with the intention of recovering Cassandra, Stern doesn't even know Cassandra is an actual person. No, no, Stern's job is to get some data, because see, Price can't access the lab's data remotely. She can self-destruct the entire lab remotely, but she can't access some of the data stored there. Now, that in of itself is a huge stretch. But even more so, what was her plan after that? Double-cross us have Becca unleash a single alien that will somehow stop a ship full of marines who, at this point, have killed far more aliens than Price's commandos seem to be able to do. And during the distraction, a small team of commandos will take out the alien and all the marines aboard the ship. Then they'll access Marlow's data that's been saved to the Otago, which, without Cassandra, the data is mostly useless anyway, at least that's what the Marlow synthetic implied. So just to recap here, Price already has an invitation to board the Otago, and once she's on it, surely one of her employees, or even Becca, who is on her payroll, could access the data that she wants and give herself a copy. There's absolutely zero reason for her to betray us. And her plan of betrayal is so unbelievably bad. 
One Xenomorph and her commandos are going to take out our entire barracks? And what if Marlowe had never sent the cultists to the Otago? How was Becca going to distract the crew long enough for the commandos to sneak aboard? And what if that one Xenomorph wasn't magically invulnerable to fire? Maiko would have ended it single-handedly. Price's plan relies on so many near-impossible events occurring just to even have a hope of success. And now let's compare that to if she hadn't betrayed us. She literally could have just said, We're coming aboard. See you soon. And no one on the Otago would have batted an eye. She could have just waltzed in and got the data she wants. And she would have had a way off the planet. This is the worst plan in the history of plans. I mean, even if she was hell-bent on betraying us, why not get aboard the Otago first and then betray us? It just makes no sense. And as for wanting Marlowe's research, isn't it in Price's interests for us to recover Cassandra? If Cassandra is so important to the research, then surely Price would want her alive and safe. So even if Price was going to betray us, it's still in her best interest to have us recover Cassandra for her. If Price knows Cassandra's location, she should be happy to tell us. And she certainly shouldn't have betrayed us until after we had Cassandra back. What is going on in this plot? And I gotta be honest, this whole sequence is just so convenient. We just happened to find the APC, which meant Maiko could still use the ARC aboard the Otago. Just as Harper falls into a coma, we meet Stern, who can act like a carbon copy of Harper for gameplay purposes. The game goes out of its way to tell this cinematic story, but the story just isn't very good. Nothing makes any sense. It's just plot contrivance after plot contrivance. The characters are all brain dead, the world has no consistent rules, everything is a mess. And it affects the gameplay too. The lack of failure states, the awful Myco levels, not being able to save the game when we want to. The desire to make this game cinematically focused was, in my opinion, a huge misstep. I'd have much preferred more freedom and more replayability to tell my own stories. The exploits of Latimer in the Mineshaft, I find that infinitely more engaging than Maiko playing hide and seek with an immortal alien ad nauseum. But hey, in this game, the developers are God and we're just pieces on the board, so we have to play by their rules. We're heading to Pharaoh Spire. The place is on lockdown, but the A's have made it to the outside areas. Now Price is located at the top of a large tower, or spire, and we have the brilliant idea of letting the xenomorphs inside the tower. Now this sounds like it might be an interesting idea, using the aliens to clear out the commandos guarding the tower. The problem is, the commandos are much less threatening than the aliens. The commandos don't increase your stress nearly as much. The commandos don't activate a hunting state. The commandos don't spawn right on top of you. Compared to the xenomorphs, the commandos are pretty much a joke. I would much rather fight an entire tower of commandos than any aliens. I mean, just the thought of an entire area without having to worry about onslaught spawning or stress levels, it genuinely sounds like heaven. But our idiot crew here insist on ruining what could have been a great thing. So as we're trying to make our way to the top of the tower, the game provides us several scenarios. Sometimes we have the option of opening a window or something to let the xenomorphs in, taking out the commandos. But again, this just means we have to fight aliens instead of commandos. And aliens are by far the more dangerous enemy. So whenever I was given the choice, I just charged straight into the commandos and took my chances. They really didn't prove much of a threat, at least compared to the xenomorphs. 
I mean, just remember, Maiko took down a whole squad of these commandos and one of their gunships all by herself. A civilian did this. And by this point in the game, we know about three missions these commandos have been sent on. Shutting down the Cerberus Protocol on Pioneer Station, obtaining the research data in Tantalus Station, and securing the Otago. All three of these missions have resulted in failure and squad wipes minus Stern. And the one guy who did survive was about to be face-hugged until we showed up to save him. And then he immediately betrayed Weyland Yutani to work for us instead. So it's pretty clear these commandos are completely useless. Why would anyone want to fight Xenomorphs instead of these pushovers? It's just one more thing that really doesn't make any sense. There's a set piece on the roof of the spire where we have to activate switches while fending off enemies. Plus, a Weyland Yutani dropship is trying to mow us down while we do all this. And as you'd expect, that thing is going to carve through our marines super quickly. Now, once the switches are activated, Pharaoh Spire's anti-air defenses are deactivated. This allows Hunslet to move in on our dropship, and we get this really cool firefight between the two ships. Hunslet busts out some pretty sweet moves to destroy the enemy vehicle. And as much as I enjoyed this, and don't get me wrong, I did enjoy it, I just can't help but remember how Maiko sat in the ARC and blew one of these ships apart in seconds. So why does Hunslet have to work so hard to achieve the same result? Why is a land vehicle packing more firepower than the much bigger dropships? And the thing is, that's the price you pay for plot armor. It makes any actual accomplishments by the other characters less meaningful. Hunslet isn't the chosen one like Maiko, so she has to actually earn her survival. And then we get this cutscene, and this is honestly one of the most bizarre dialogue exchanges I've ever seen. Not just in a video game, but in anything ever. Right! You did it because you understand. You understand the companies and the general interest are one and the same. Marlowe was right. Well, before he went crazy, that is. The things he found in that mine. What they could mean for pharmaceutics, space travel, security. The applications are virtually limitless. I wouldn't want any of that. Then think about the revenues these creatures represent. Imagine. Space stations a hundred times bigger and safer than Pioneer. So in the end, that's what this is about? Money? Numbers? How could you be such a machine? Really? Oh, not you, Maiko. Spare me the whistleblower lecture, will you? Who do you think I am? A synth? <laughs> Excuse me. A synth. I've pretty much built this world. You really think a synth would have handled half of what I've done on Leafy? It all makes sense now. What? Maiko, listen. Your assessments, your ploys, two of your teams left for dead, your extensive knowledge of the station, of the atmospheric processors. I'm the damn director of that rock. Don't you get it? And yet, you couldn't stop that protocol. Would you listen to me? Everything out there, it's mine. I could have saved these people. But you didn't. So much power, and you did nothing with it. Except protecting the assets of this fucking company. We could have talked. Harper. He would have welcomed you on board. But you didn't think of that, did you? You didn't think of your own life. Not a single time, right? Do you think a human would do that? Maiko. These assets? Marlowe's research? I don't have it anymore. It's all uploaded somewhere on the Otago. Burn it! Print it! Sell it to Siegson or the UPP for all I care. But take me with you, please. Cassandra, where is she? Is she even alive? Do you have that stored somewhere in that carbon processor of yours? Stop it! I am not a synth. <sighs> Look, she's probably with all their prisoners. In their city, below Olduvai. 
A city? Marlow's lair. Ancient and alien. God, he was so obsessed with that place. And then he became obsessed with her. He wouldn't keep Cassandra anywhere else. Now please, take me with you! No. Maiko! Look at me! I'm not a synth! I doubt you're human either. Maiko? Listen to me! I'm not a fucking synth! I am not a synth! I'm not a synth! So I just, what, what in the name of God did we just witness? Firstly, Maiko's assertion that Price is a synthetic. There's really no evidence to support that claim. Maiko says not once did Price try to save herself or her employees. But see, there's only one problem with that. It's literally one of the first things Price did when we met her. That was the deal we made, the one that I told you to remember the details for. A third of the game's missions have been based around that entire premise. So what on earth is Maiko talking about? It's honestly like this dialogue was written for a different game. This entire cutscene felt so incredibly out of place for everything we've seen up until now. And as soon as Maiko says this, Price replies that she doesn't care about the research. She wants to leave on the Otago. Now Maiko correctly states that Harper would have let her on the Otago, but Maiko, my dear, the reason Price rejected that offer is not because she's a synthetic, it's because this story is one of the dumbest stories ever told. And then we have the end of the cutscene. Price literally has a gun and could take Maiko hostage, forcing her way onto the Otago. Even if they lock her up in a cell. Heck, even if they kill her once she's aboard. It's better than getting eaten by aliens, isn't it? And why didn't the Marines accompany Maiko into the room to protect her? Heck, Price could have offered the location of Marlowe's base after she was aboard the Otago. There were so many ways this could have played out. But instead, we just get this absolute mess that just left me scratching my head. This was just truly so strange. It just feels so out of place. Literally every single aspect of the Price storyline is nothing more than a series of contradictions and stupidity. And I'm guessing the developers wanted us to really ponder the question, is she a synthetic or isn't she? But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. So why would we bother spending so much as two seconds thinking about this? She's either a human with severe brain damage, or a synthetic whose programming is as broken as this game's drone mechanics. Either way, like I said, the end result is the same. A storyline that just doesn't make sense. But anyway, now that we know where Marlowe's base is, I get the feeling we're at the end of the game. There was a secondary objective at Pharaoh Spire that I missed, so I decide to go back for it. There's some data relating to Waylon Yutani's illegal activities. Maiko has suggested we may be able to use this information to blackmail the company into leaving us alone should we actually survive escaping Lethe. I thought this might provide some sort of secret ending, so I decide, since we've got time, let's return to Pharaoh Spire and find the info that we missed. And this was actually the first time I returned to a level after completing all the primary objectives. See, at first I was racing the alien infestation level, and then as the game progressed I was racing the doom clock. So I really didn't want to waste a day of deployment going back to an area that we had already done. And I gotta say, I made quite the discovery here. Look at the alien threat level. No, really, look at it. 
yeah, it's non-existent. There is no threat level. And the implications for this are massive. That means you can mow down all the aliens you like and they will never enter hunting mode. That means no stress increase due to being hunted. That means no increase in alien difficulty. That means no random boss aliens spawning on the map. That means no onslaughts. Well, none outside the scripted ones, of course. This is honestly the best thing ever. I love this. So we run up to a queen that was hanging out behind the strip club and we just lay waste to her and all her children as if we're Zuckerberg and they're all meta employees after the latest financial earnings report. Just pure devastation. And no need to worry about racking up a plethora of traumas for doing it. Now I'm simply not articulate enough to truly express the extent of my joy when I found this out. It makes this game so much more fun to play. We can just freely explore at our leisure. And even when we do get some BS aliens spawning right on top of us, it's no big deal. We can just eradicate them and continue on our merry way without issue. This is honestly brilliant. Now understand, as happy as I am about this from a gameplay perspective, it makes zero sense from a story perspective. The last time we saw Pharaoh Spire, Xenomorphs were swarming all over the tower like a biblical plague. Thousands of them. Now they're all just gone, apparently. But like I said, it makes our life easier, so we'll take it. Now getting the data we want is so incredibly easy without having to worry about the alien aggressiveness level. There are some commandos still patrolling the area, but we can mop them up like it's nothing. Now assuming every mission works this way, which again I assume they do, being able to return without having to worry about the aliens too much is probably the best way to play the game. Just rush the primary objectives and then once you've finished that, you can return and complete all the secondary objectives much more easily. At least up until the doom clock activates, this is probably the best way to go. And doing things this way may increase the alien infestation level, sure, but it maxes out at level 5, and I imagine for most players it's going to reach level 5 well before you get anywhere close to finishing the game anyway, so it's probably not worth worrying about too much. And yeah, now it's time for the final mission. And even though this is the final mission, the highest ranked soldier I'm sending is level 7. The maximum they can reach is 10, but I haven't gotten any of my troops even close to that. And some weapons can only be unlocked once you have a level 10 soldier, so I did miss out on a fair bit in my playthrough. And where is the final mission, you ask? Well, it's actually back at the refinery, if you can remember that. And I really liked this. The refinery was the first level where we really started getting some serious story developments. And it was a level that we had to evac out of with the help of Maiko's missile. So it was a really nice touch returning to this place. And I actually kicked myself for not seeing it coming. I mean, the game literally told us this is where the crates with the aliens are coming from. But then we got distracted with the whole nuclear Armageddon thing. So as much as I've ragged on the storytelling in this game, I'll give props where it's due. And this was really well done. So we access this massive lift that's going to take us down to the depths of Lethe. In the basement area of the refinery, we take out the cultists and form a bit of a bulkhead with some sentry guns. And then we venture further in to try and find Cassandra. And it's here I need to raise a really big annoyance that I have with the gameplay. It's been an issue for the last couple of missions, but here is where it got really super annoying. And my issue is the controls. And I know, you're probably thinking, how on earth could the controls in a game like this be bad? You just click on where you want to go. But see, it comes back to the stealth mechanics. I said quite a long time ago now that you can't individually control your troops. There's only group control. Not only can you not control individual soldiers, but when you select an action, like picking up some loot as an example, the game will automatically select what it claims is the most appropriate soldier for the task. Now in theory this is fine, 
The problem is it really sucks at doing this. See, when you're trying to remain stealthy, the recon unit with their ability to silently take down aliens is huge. By far the most useful class. Now for this reason, your recon soldier is the one you want to always have on standby ready to take down any approaching enemies. So who does the game send to grab the loot the vast majority of the time? Yeah, the recon, who else? Literally the only person you don't want completing that task, anyone else would be fine. But when they're grabbing the loot, the recon can't use their silent headshot ability, which means losing stealth is all but guaranteed if an enemy decides to wander into you while the recon unit is grabbing the loot. And picking up loot takes time, it's not an instant thing. So that really sucks. But it's not even the worst part. No, see, the worst part is you cannot position your recon unit at the front of the group. So you move into an area and the enemy can see you. The orange line is turning red real fast and you want to snipe that enemy before you lose stealth. Except your recon is at the back of the group and their line of sight is still blocked by the doorway that the front man has already moved through. And the amount of times I wanted to headshot an enemy but I simply couldn't because the game wouldn't let me place the recon where I wanted in the team's formation, it was infuriating. Now when you combine that with not being able to save the game when you want to, and the game's auto-saving not always working, and the fact that breaking stealth is really punishing, it makes for a pretty miserable experience. If we can't control individual soldiers, only the group, then the soldiers shouldn't have individual line of sight. All abilities should simply go off group line of sight. And conversely, if the soldiers are going to have individual lines of sight, we need to be able to control each soldier individually and be able to place them where we want to place them. They're a recon unit, they're meant to be the scout, they're meant to be doing reconnaissance. Let me put them at the front of the squad so they can do their job. And don't force me to use them to grab loot, leaving the team completely incapable of silently taking down foes. I mean, look at this one. We move into a room, our recon Linky is at the back, of course, we use a headshot to take down one cultist, but Linky can't get line of sight on the second. So we just walk out of the room, and then a second later we return into the room and use headshot on the second guard. And while we're doing this, the second cultist has just casually watched his friend get a hole blown through his skull, and he doesn't even respond. He doesn't even care. He just stands there waiting for us to do the same thing to him. So, if you're going to punish the player for not being stealthy, then the stealth mechanics need to be good. And here, that's just sadly not the case. So I ended up using two recon units whenever I could. It's not the best solution, but it effectively doubles the chance you'll have line of sight on headshot when you need to use it. But the fact that it's left to chance at all is horrendous. Now if I had known this going in, I would have promoted a lot more soldiers to recons. In fact, I see no reason not to take two recons and zero techs on every mission once you can deploy five soldiers. I mean, you might even want to consider ditching the medic and bringing three recons. These guys are really powerful. Now the gunner and the sergeant classes are useful enough that I'd recommend keeping at least one of them around, gunners for their stopping power, and sergeants to give you more command points. After all, the recon's headshot ability requires command points to use, so you want to have plenty of those up your sleeve. But moving on, the cultists have set up a barricade blocking our path, so we have to find an alternative way through, and that requires venturing into the mines. And this place is true end game material. See the metal that was being mined at Trimonite, it's interfering with our motion tracker. So no warnings about nearby enemies when you're in this place. And yeah, that alone really ramps up the horror factor. 
Every time you go around a corner or open a door, you have no idea if there's something waiting there to rip your face off. And I like this, it was tense in a good way. And then, just when I'm thinking it can't get any more brutal, the cultists shut off the power. So now we have no motion tracker and everything is pitch black. This was probably the most difficult section of the game, but for the most part, it felt like a fair challenge. An opportunity for the player to put to the test all the knowledge and skills they've acquired throughout the game. It was a really cool sequence. Now thankfully, after not too long, we're able to reactivate the power and battle our way through to the mine's exit. Now Maiko warns us that once we open this bulkhead door, alarms will likely start ringing out. And you can see me here deploying all five sentry guns that we have. So the sentry guns plus our troops, that's 10 guns that are going to be blasting away. I'm expecting any aliens or cultists who try to mess with us to get absolutely destroyed. And while these wave defense style set pieces are reasonably common throughout the campaign, the interesting part is you're never 100% sure where the bad guys are going to be coming from, at least not the first time you do it. So that does a good job at keeping you on your toes and stopping these sections from feeling repetitive. Now this one is an infinite onslaught, so that means the Xenomorphs will never stop coming. We just need to evacuate as we'll eventually run out of ammo. I leave a couple of sentry guns behind to cover us as we make our escape. Means we lose the sentry guns, but a small price to pay for our lives. So then we find ourselves back in the refinery basement on the opposite side of the barrier that was previously blocking our path. So needless to say, the cultists have a pretty bad day right here. As you also might expect, our team is pretty wiped after that mine section, so it's time to evac. And before we can deploy again, you know what we have, a low morale event on the strategic layer. And while this event is becoming a meme at this point, we have eight days left on the Doom Clock, which I'm feeling pretty confident should be more than enough time to beat the game, so it didn't really annoy me too much anymore. If anything, it just made me laugh at the absurdity. Like the troops are just like, yeah, there's only a week to go until nuclear Armageddon, but we can afford a day off to Netflix and chill. I'm gonna be honest, these guys' motivation to stay alive kinda seems a bit lacking. And so here is where I finally clue in to bring two recons with me on the mission like I was talking about earlier. And it does make keeping stealth significantly less frustrating. But little did I know I was soon to encounter an issue that would be far, far more frustrating. See, we ride the APC into the new area we've opened up in the basement. Our objective updates to take out the cultists guarding the bulkhead door. So we lay waste to every cultist in the area. Like anyone who is even remotely close to this door has been sent to their maker, a one-way trip. The area around the door and the area marked on the map has been well and truly cleared. It cannot get any clearer, but the objective doesn't update. So I figure the game must want me to slaughter even more of these guys. So let's go find them. And I'm wandering around this stank hole for a stupid amount of time. It was about 40 minutes before it dawns on me that something is wrong, really wrong. Now during our aimless wandering, we did get a random bit of dialogue about a power loader, being told that we can't use this particular power loader. It's damaged or not working for some reason, but that's not really important to me. The thing I'm wondering about is why on earth would we be able to use a power loader? The game hasn't told us anything about needing a power loader. So I try going online to find out what I'm supposed to do, but again, the game has only been out for a few days at this point, so there's no guides or discussions that I can find in relation to this area of the game. I mean, it is a late game section, so probably not that many people have got this far at this time. Google is giving me nothing. These truly are dark times. But eventually, I am able to find a video from a YouTube channel called Gamers Little Playground. This video is almost 14 hours long and contains a complete playthrough of the whole game. And here I am thinking I was the long form king. 
I need to step up my game. I got nothing on these guys. So anyway, in this near 14 hour long video, I need to find the part of the game that I'm up to and check out what's going on. And do you know what it's like using that little bar on the YouTube video player to scroll through 14 hours to pinpoint one exact spot? It's not easy. But sure enough, I get the answers that I need. The objective should have updated when we murked those cultists. But it didn't. So I try reloading to an earlier point in the mission, but nothing is working. So I end up having to reload back to the Otago and play the entire deployment all over again. So the last 50 minutes of gameplay have been a complete waste of time. Now this time I make sure to move at a snail's pace while approaching the door so the objective has ample time to update. And once that's done, sure enough, our next objective is to find a power loader to open the bulkhead door. Now the good part about wasting almost an hour of my life is that I know the layout of this place pretty well by this point. I've got a good idea where we'll be able to grab a power loader, so finding it doesn't take too long. Once we have the power loader, the walk back to the bulkhead door, however, well, we have to move at the snail's pace of the power loader, so it takes a while. It takes a long while. Especially when the power loader pilot decides to walk the long way around this massive structure, instead of just cutting across and taking a fraction of the time. They're making sure to drag this out as long as humanly possible. And nothing is happening while we're doing this, mind you. It's literally just watching the power loader slowly waddle from point A to point B. Hold up, I spoke too soon. There's some bad guys. Finally, some actual gameplay. Let's take them out. And then finally, after a truly monotonous sequence, we arrive at the bulkhead door and... Yep. Nothing happens. The characters warn us an onslaught would come once we tried opening the door, but the joke's on them because our power loader driver isn't going to open the door. Ever. Nah, we're just gonna stand here for the rest of time. Or until the nuclear missiles turn us into dust. And to be perfectly honest, the latter actually sounds more enjoyable at this point in time. Look at our objective there, my friends. Protect the power loader. And that's what our objective has been since we got hold of this thing. Not to open the door, just to protect the power loader. Yeah, the mission objective has failed to update again. That totally boring walk over to the door where almost nothing happened, we were supposed to be getting attacked by aliens that entire time. The way the power loader took the long path back to the door? Well, that's because aliens were supposed to be charging at us from the shorter path, forcing us to go around the long way. Yeah, two reloads because of the game glitching. And may I remind you, if you play on the no one can hear them scream setting, the game barely saves at all. So it's entirely possible I'd be having to play this entire deployment for a third time due to glitches. I honestly can't remember a worse experience I've had with a game recently. This was like torture. It was truly, truly miserable. And it's here I began to understand the title of the game, Dark Descent. It's not the Marines that are descending into the darkness. It's you, the player. The game promises you so much in the beginning upon reaching Lethe, but as the difficulty ramps up, the flaws in the game's mechanics become more and more noticeable. The game becomes more and more broken, the plot more and more absurd, until you realise, at some point along the way, you fell into the very pits of hell. You descended. I mean, I can see this happening in the underworld. Poor, tormented souls being forced to play through the refinery basement section over and over for all eternity. Every time they think they've finished, the game glitches and they have to restart the mission all over again. A truly Lovecraftian fate.
But finally, the game decides to actually work and we make it through what was not just the worst section of the game, but one of the worst sections of any game. I mean, even if we think about the Abbey in Midnight Suns, at least it functioned correctly, at least you could actually navigate and quest objectives would update. This level right here, this was just completely broken. Terrible, terrible stuff on this one. Now thankfully we're out of it, and we enter a large area where the cultists begin flanking us. I was expecting this part to be pretty difficult, but after we end the initial wave of cultists, the rest of them in the room, they just stand there. They do nothing and just let us pick them off one by one. And I'm not even gonna meme on this. At this point, I was so ready for the game to be over, I was just happy to take whatever easy encounter I could get. If it means we're gonna see those end credits roll more quickly, I'm supporting it at this point. So once we've secured the area, we need to defend it for long enough for the dropship to arrive. See, this is the entrance to Marlow's base, so we're trying to establish a foothold. And this part is probably the toughest onslaught we'll face in the game. We're in a totally open area, and the aliens just swarm us from all directions. It's literally just 360 degrees of murderous hostility. And while we do have the APC backing us up, we can't actually enter it. So its ability to keep our troops safe is somewhat limited. So you want to go all out at this part, because you can be guaranteed that that's what the aliens are going to do. In fact, multiple boss aliens will charge in at the same time. Now it's certainly a tough fight, but our marines slog it out through great might and heroism. Truly, this was an epic display, and I cannot think of a reward fitting enough for their brave and noble deeds here today. The stand these fine warriors took in the face of overwhelming evil is something for the history books, no doubt. So then the only question is, where do we go from here? How do we top that? <laughs> this cutscene really cracked me up when I played the game. Like, I was genuinely in hysterics. I think it was a combination of how unexpected it was, the vacant glassy look in her cold dead NPC eyes, and just how ridiculous her attire is. Like, Maiko's here to save the day by LARPing as a soldier. And just to recap, this is the footage of her trying to fight an alien at the start of the game. So yeah, I'm sure this Maiko being a soldier thing is gonna end really well. And as many problems as I've had with the game so far, this may be the worst. No, scratch that. The quests not updating is definitely the worst. This might be the second worst. Just watch what happens here. Maiko tells Stern she's here to save Cassandra. So she, Stern, and the bald man whose name I don't even remember because he's really not that important, they all descend into Marlo's base. Now this in of itself is fine, but they leave all of the marines behind. Two old dudes and a civilian are gonna face down our final enemy, leaving all the soldiers who have fought the entire campaign just hanging out in the refinery. And this, this perfectly captures the entire problem I have with this game. We get to the final section of the final mission and we're told to just forget about the troops that we've been playing with for the whole game and have formed an attachment with. Instead, focus on a bunch of stock standard cliche characters. And I'm not exaggerating here. Latimer, Killzone, Kaz 2. We're not going to see any of them again for the rest of the game. The final mission will be carried out by these three troglodytes. Again, one of them, I don't even know his name because he's been so unimportant to the plot. And Stern is literally just a plot device with a pulse. We needed a way into Pharaoh Spire, and he exists purely to enable us to do that. He barely qualifies as a character at all. So that leaves Maiko. 
And Maiko in of herself as a character is fine, but she's been the centerpiece of the very worst missions of the game. Those hide and seek sections were just horrible. So I have zero desire to play as any of these people. Latimer may be a needy sook, but she's my sook, and I want her here when I finish the game. I don't want the Three Stooges. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the game just doesn't focus on our troops enough. But anyway, it's us and the Three Stooges. That's what we've got to work with, so let's do it. And just look at the ground here. The texture on the dirt hasn't loaded in properly. So I'm playing with garbage characters while experiencing PS2 level graphics. I tell you, it just keeps getting better and better. But to be fair, something actually interesting happens here. We finally encounter the real Marlow, or what's left of him at least. Now of course there is a synthetic version still alive and well. Wait, are synthetics alive? I don't know, he hasn't been torn apart by Ayla Mouse, so you know what I mean. But yeah, I thought this was a cool plot development. We actually go through the whole game without ever meeting the primary antagonist face to face. And you don't see that too often, I think that's a cool idea, and I did really like this. Now we do have the option to shoot the synthetic, but I opt not to. I'm mostly just curious what will happen if we let him live. And then check out this big boy. Apparently this is the species that lived on Lethe before humans arrived. Now it is established in the films that the xenomorphs take on characteristics of the creature they gestate inside. So an alien that grew inside a dog might have somewhat different physical characteristics to one that grew inside a human. And looking at the size of this juggernaut, I've got a very bad feeling about the alien that burst out of his chest. Now we do encounter a few more Marlows before it's finally time for combat. We have unlimited command points, which may sound cool in theory, but we only have two abilities to spend them on, the shotgun and the grenade. So it's really just freezing the game over and over, spamming an ungodly amount of grenades, and it's actually really boring. It could have been cool, but the waves of aliens just last too long, and it gets really repetitive. Same enemies, you're just doing the same attacks, it's really not that interesting. Now this place is quite the maze, and there's a few dead ends we encounter as we press our way forward, and then one of the Marlow synthetics is actually guiding us. These Marlows have zero issue with us coming for Cassandra, which is pretty interesting, I think. Should we trust these guys? Probably not. And then look at this, a whole bunch of Marlows. And you may have already worked it out, but this is the point in the game where the Marlows spell it out for us really clearly. Cassandra has the ability to control the Xenomorphs. No doubt that's linked to the abilities that her father has. And so Marlow's research has focused on controlling Cassandra, thereby giving him the power to control the aliens. And so finally, it's taken a long time, but here she is. We found Harper Jr. And of course, because their usefulness to the plot is over, Bald Man and Stern get killed within literal seconds of each other. Yeah, we've found the alien that burst out of the big unit's chest. And honestly, this was so pathetic. Like, the writers of the game don't even care about these characters. They're just plot devices. They've outlived their usefulness, so now they have to be killed off. And if the writers don't care about them, why on earth should we be expected to care about them? And it turns out we've come pretty much full circle. The game began with Maiko playing a game of hide and seek with an alien. Now we're playing a game of tag with an alien. I was hoping the Marlows might show up and slow the creature down, which would be a nice little bonus for the people who chose not to shoot them. But no, the Marlows have just vanished into the ether. The big Lamau is too big to follow us, so we find ourselves back in the pool of eggs. We've managed to escape our pursuer. Now when we were running from the big boy, we wanted to move as quickly as we could. Here we want to do the opposite. We want to take our time and move slowly because regular xenomorphs are going to spawn on top of us. If we try to run, they'll just catch us and destroy us. So moving slowly and using Maiko's rifle to fend them off is the best bet. 
And it's not a bad idea. You want to move fast. You want to be out of this area. But the game forces you to go slow. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. So that's pretty cool. Soon enough, Big Boy bursts through a wall and the chase is on once more. So we got to start running. And then the process just repeats. You need to defend yourself from more regular aliens. It was a nice idea the first time. The second time now, it's starting to feel gamey. And that leads to the main event that I know you've all been waiting for. Big Boy somehow gets in front of the pair, so Maiko and Cassandra decide to stop running away and instead stand totally still, just staring at the giant monster that wants to squash them. Now I know what you're thinking. Such a move is surely a death sentence. Maybe they should run back the other way. They should try and get around it. They should try something. But if you've been paying attention up until now, you know that's not how things work in this game. For the power of Maiko's plot armor shall know no equal. No force, earthly or beyond, can stand up to the power of Maiko's plot armor. So Harper, the father I mean, who is effectively in a coma aboard the Otago, he uses his psychic powers to control the alien, the big boy. And he keeps this thing stationary long enough for the two women to return to their original plan of running away. So yes, through the power of love, the big alien has been stopped. Now such a cliche naturally causes Harper Senior to instantly drop dead from cringe. After all, his usefulness to the plot is also over now. And we surely cannot allow him to hang around even one second beyond what's needed to advance the story. Meanwhile, the ladies ride the elevator back to safety. We get this nice fade to black, and it seems the duo have escaped. Or have they? Yes, they actually have. They run to the dropship and it takes off. Now, I was expecting the big boy to chase the elevator up in order to have a final boss battle where our marines go head to head with this behemoth. You know, so the game finishes on a high note with the characters we've been playing with the whole campaign. But nah, we all just jump on the ship and fly away. I mean, at least this cutscene shows that the marines were still fighting off the aliens on the surface. So they at least weren't totally useless in the final leg of the race. But yeah, no grand battle to finish things off. No last hurrah with our marines. We just get a cutscene of Lethe being destroyed, you know, even though we still had a week left on the Doom Clock. Then the Otago shields hold out long enough to escape the Cerberus Protocol missiles, and we can finally leave the worst planet in the universe. Cassandra never gets to be reunited with her father, and you know that blackmail we picked up to help protect us from Waylon Yutani reprisal? Yeah, it never gets mentioned. No secret ending here. Instead, the crew just head off into space, leaving us with a screen as black and lifeless as my soul after playing that final mission. And I do want to come back to the plot here, because I have a lot of questions. We never found out how Harper and Cassandra's powers actually work, or where these powers came from. So that ghost the writers threw at us right at the start of the game an equally poorly thought out plot device as Stern. None of the questions raised by the ghost were ever answered. No satisfying conclusion to be found. Like, how did Harper and Cassandra get this power? How does it work? What exactly can they do? What distance can it cover? Harper was able to control the big boy while the Otago was already in the air. He was further away from the aliens, but his ability to control them somehow became stronger. If you're going to have multiple characters with random superpowers, you could at least attempt to explain them. How they work, give them some rules. So what are my final thoughts on this game? I know I've been very negative, and I know some people don't like that, but I gotta be honest, it's just what I think. And I will say, I don't hate this game. To me, this is a mixed bag. The early missions were really fun and I was having a great time, but as I progressed further in, the problems in the mechanics became more apparent. The glitches became infuriating. The plot fell apart. The final mission is one of the most unsatisfying I've ever played. 
like take away all the cool stuff we've been acquiring over the campaign so we can play a game of tag with a character who we're not even that invested in. And maybe if the bad stuff had been at the start of the game and then the end of the game was really good, maybe I wouldn't have been so soured on the overall experience. But yeah, the late game stuff, it left a bad taste in my mouth. So I guess I don't really know what my final thoughts about this game are. I mean, if you just want to kill Xenomorphs, I guess you'll like this. But by that logic, you probably liked Colonial Marines as well. I wish I had some profound way to sum things up, but I just can't. The game just left me feeling meh. It's not horrible by any means. Apart from the glitches, they're definitely horrible. But it's just really mediocre. It kind of reminds me of Phoenix Point in a lot of ways. There's some really good things about the game, but there's also a lot of really bad things. But here's the rub, right? Despite all those bad things, assuming that the glitches have been fixed and the quests actually progress correctly, I'm not entirely opposed to playing through this again. Maybe on stream where I have people to talk to, and if I skip all the cutscenes, yeah, there could be some fun to be had here. And that means, at the very least, the game is decent. And I would be interested in a sequel or a spin-off-like game, if the developers can fix the glitches while also better balancing some of the mechanics, like saving and stealth and stress levels, there's a solid foundation here that a really good game could come from. And I guess that's part of why I found playing this game so frustrating. Like, the game missed the mark, but it does have quite a bit of potential as a base for future games. This could have been so much better than what it is. So anyway, that's my opinion. Whether you agree or disagree with me, all I can do is give my honest take. Now, this video has gone on way longer than I ever expected it to, so I hope you liked it. If you'd be interested in me covering other games in a similar fashion where I go through a whole playthrough, let me know in the comments. And remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you did like this one. It really helps me out. So thank you very much for watching this marathon of a video. I know it's a big time investment and I do appreciate it. So until next time, have a great day.